All right, everybody, we're going to get started here in a moment with our April meeting. Uh, good morning. I'm pleased to call to order the 259th meeting of the Pacific Fishery Management Council conducted via webinar. This meeting is open to the public and copies of the meeting agenda and other documents used by the council during this meeting are available on the council's website. We encourage members of the public to testify and provide the council with their comments on any agenda item taken up by the council. In planning to testify, it is important for anyone wishing to testify to understand that when the count that when the council will take public comment on a particular agenda item cannot always be accurately forecast in advance. In particular, people should be aware that agenda items currently scheduled for the end of the day might be taken up the next day and agenda items may also be moved up by a day. Please note that the chat feature should be used for technical issues only and not to make public comment. To comment on an agenda item, you must sign up on our electronic public comment portal available on the March Council meeting webpage. After public comment has begun on an item, no more names will be taken to testify. Each person has one opportunity to testify on each agenda item. Testimony on behalf of another person not in attendance will only be allowed within the period allowed for the person in attendance. Generally, I will limit individual testimony to five minutes and 10 minutes for groups or individuals representing organizations. Some agenda items may have several people wishing to testify and if necessary, to allow time for everyone to be heard, I will reduce the amount of time per individual or group. We have a visual countdown timer that shows your remaining time allotment. Anyone wishing to include a presentation with their comment needs to submit presentations prior to 5 p.m. on the day before the agenda item is on the agenda. Documents need to be submitted to Chris Kleinschmidt and Sandra Krauss please contact Chris Kleinschmidt or the Secretariat if you have questions. Anyone wishing to include written electronic comments in support of your verbal testimony, please provide them in electronic format to Chris Kleinschmidt and Sandra Krauss prior to 5 p.m. on the day before the agenda item, and the comments will be made part of the official record of this meeting via the electronic portal. This meeting is being recorded and live streamed over the internet. Copies of the recordings will be available from the council website, or you may purchase audio recording copies from the meeting recorder, Mr. Craig Hess. Let me remind council members and others to speak directly to the microphone so that all can hear. Lastly, I ask that all council members and members of the audience turn off the sound ringers on their cell phones and mute your connection while the council meeting is in session. Uh, our executive director, Mr. Chuck Tracy, will now call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, council members, as I call your name, please acknowledge your presence. Corey Niles. Present. Bill Anderson. Here. B. Evenson. Present. Michael Clark. Present. Bob Dooley. I am here. Mark Gorelnik. Still here. Dave Hansen. Here. Pete Hassemer. Present. David Hogan. Absent. Maggie Summer. Present. Scott McGrew. Here. Virgil Moore. Here. Joe Oatman. Present. Brad Pettinger. Here. 
Butch Smith. Here. Krista Svensson. Krista, I see your name on the list, but I haven't heard you acknowledge. You are still muted on your end somehow. I see you're unmuted on the application. If you're here, can you, if you can hear us, can you raise your hand? Okay, looks like Chris is having some technical difficulties. Uh, Mr. Tracy, uh, yes. Chris has indicated her presence through the chat feature. Through the chat feature, thank you. Uh, Frank Lockhart. Frank, I see you on the list, but I'm not hearing your acknowledgement. Um, here. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Marcy Remco. Good morning. I'm here. And Louis M. And I'm here as well. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You have a quorum. Thanks very much, Chuck. And um, uh, I'll ask you now to make the executive director's report. Thank you. Uh, so this is agenda item A3. Uh, this report typically provides information uh, on the informational reports uh, or points of emphasis or updates on proposed agenda, updates from the Council Coordination Committee, uh, matters of interest not on the proposed agenda or other matters associated with optimizing the council process. So uh, we do have a number of informational reports, just real quickly. Uh, we have two reports from the United States Coast Guard. First, their uh, annual report, uh, and then a second report that's their uh, IUU strategic vision report. We have a report on the uh, West Coast 2020 whale entanglement summary. We have our annual reports from the mothership and catcher processor co-ops uh, from the whiting fishery. We have an announcement of some additional CARES Act funding. And finally, we've got a uh, fact sheet that was released uh, by the White House uh, at the end of, end of last month. Um, and among other things, it uh, states a goal of developing uh, 30 gigabytes of wind energy offshore by uh, the year 30, 2030, sorry. So another 3030 um, type of, uh, priority for the White House. Um, uh, some other, uh, other things to mention, um, just kind of as we go through our uh, April meeting, as, as with the March meeting, and as typical, just want to remind council members that uh, we'll need to uh, allow for some flexibility with the salmon agenda items as they go through their iterative processes uh, while they appear on the, on the uh, agendas uh, at a specific time. Um, those usually aren't too reliable, I guess. Uh, so de just depending on the status of the negotiations and the need to turn things around quickly there to uh, get the next uh, set of guidance to the salmon technical team for analysis, uh, we need to provide some flexibility there. Uh, let's see, we've got uh, one thing I did want to mention. Um, we've uh, been working with the MREP, the Marine Resource Education Program, um, uh, to develop a uh, promotional video for the West Coast MREP program. Um, so uh, we've completed that project. The video is available and um, you will, uh, we will, at some point, we will um, be playing that uh, video during some of the breaks. It's about a minute and a half long. So uh, we'll kick off a few of our breaks with that. So I just encourage you to take a, take a look at it and, uh, and see what we've been up to. Uh, then uh, uh, also an update from Bohm. Uh, so I do have uh, one attachment in your uh, in briefing material. So agenda item A3, supplemental attachment one, it's a Bohm email. Uh, we had a uh, council staff and uh, uh, Dr. Braby and, and Eric Wilkins, or actually uh, it's not Eric, but his um, stand in for Eric met with uh, Bohm as, as kind of our usual um, routine uh, prior to the council meeting. We meet with them to see if there are any issues 
that we need to be aware of uh, or that we want them to be aware of and um, to kind of coordinate our activities and make sure that the council stays up to speed on that. Um, it, was a, it was a productive meeting. Uh, we discussed the results of the Habitat Committee um, meeting and, and, the, and March's uh, presentation and discussion there. Um, we also, uh, they also expressed an interest, uh, which is the subject of the email basically, is um, to, to sort of uh, uh, promote our uh, further engagement um, by way of uh, uh, engaging in, in uh, uh, data uh, vetting issues, I guess, since that was one of the topics that main topics that came up at the March meeting. The, they are interested in um, accessing our expertise and, uh, and getting some feedback uh, from the data sets they're using. Um, so, uh, so that was one one aspect that they were interested in doing. And then, secondly, uh, sort of using us as a as a go to stakeholder engagement process. Uh, so, I think those are both very encouraging uh, developments, and and uh, we're happy to uh, to um, see that they uh, think they can rely on us to uh, to further their process. And and, uh, and uh, my response, of course, was positive that we would be, uh, be happy to do that. And we would talk to them further after this meeting, after we had some more discussion. So anyway, uh, just positive developments, I think, in our uh, relationship with, uh, with the BOEM offshore energy development process. Uh, and then finally, um, we've, uh, I, I did want to bring up um, one agenda uh, consideration that since we'll be uh, adopting the agenda, the next agenda item, um, there's, uh, we do have a, a legislative matter scheduled for day last, Thursday, April 15th. Uh, the only substantive issues um, on that agenda item are a couple of letters that uh, the council directed uh, that we draft uh, from the March meeting um, on Executive Order 14008. Uh, one of them is on Section 216A, which is the uh, uh, thirty percent conservation of lands and waters by the year 2030 issue a development of criteria and recommendations for guidelines for and uh, for uh, categorizing uh, conserved areas and uh, monitoring progress uh, so there's a letter uh, in regards to that and secondly there's a letter on 216c which is um, uh, ways to um, make our um, fisheries more climate resilient or resilient to climate change. Um, so there, those two letters uh, were submitted to the, in the supplemental briefing book. I think there's a fair amount of interest from advisory bodies in those. So um, we thought, it, um, given the potential for changes to the letters, um, we thought it would be wise to consider moving uh, legislative matters up, uh, perhaps to Tuesday so that uh, the council could get a uh, see what the advisory bodies um, had to say about that and that would give us some time to refine the letters and uh, and then complete the action if if necessary on day last um, so that we wouldn't uh, have that lingering after the council uh, adjourns and we could uh, turn those letters around one of them is um, on a rather tight timeline so uh, so my recommendation would be to um, to open legislative matters on Tuesday, April 13th um, in the morning uh, prior, well, or at least prior to the uh, ground fish, sable fish gear switching agenda item. And then take that as far as uh, as we can. If uh, And then if we need to, we can leave it open and um, finalize approval of those uh, letters uh, as the council see fits on day last. So that is my report. So um, I'll pause there, see if there's any questions, comments. Uh, Bob Dooley has his hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thanks, Chuck, for that great report. I, ju I just wanted to know if it was appropriate time to comment on the MREP video trailer. I just wanted to inform the council of some of the progress there and some of the acknowledgments, if, if, if it's appropriate. Sure. <clears throat> You know, I really want to thank NOAA Fisheries and the Council particularly for supporting the video 
it was the steering committee of MREP, which is comprised of many of the people in the in the council family here, that uh, thought it would be a good idea during this COVID time when we're not uh, actually uh, conducting live in-person MREP uh, workshops to um, to work on something like this to actually keep the the momentum going. And I think it, it I'm pleased as punch that uh, it came out so well. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Lauren O'Brien from the program manager of MREP for guiding us through, as well as her administrative assistant, Leah McNichol. And then, of course, the, the committee was Jennifer Gilden, Heather Mann, and myself working with uh, all of us together to put together this video. And, um, the, of course, we enlisted the help of the Timber and Frame Video Production Company from Portland, Maine. We did an a a excellent job and reasonable price as Ben Severance was the is the lead on that and the owner of the company. And then of course I want to thank Dan Wolford, Rex Leach, and Jamie Diamond. You will see that they did the voiceovers and uh in that. And I just trying to be brief here, but you know we we decided as a steering committee, the 20 plus members, the, that proceeding with MREP as normal, trying to do it virtual would be really counterproductive to the the MREP process and the, the team building and the, the camaraderie that it builds as well as the in-person relationship building. And we thought that it would not be as effective and maybe even detrimental to the program. So we, in, the, in the meantime, we, we've, we've scheduled a few other things to do. And so we're planning MREP to start it again next year in person and looking forward to that and hoping this video will support that. Other things we've done, February 18th through 19th, we did two half-day conferences, primarily of video, uh, I mean, primarily of MEMREP alumni to work on COVID-19 effects and discuss that. It was very successful, but it, I think the background of being a COVID uh, or a MREP participant and alumni helped keep that, that feel of the, of the conference and the, and the familiarity of it. And then we also have a mentoring and coaching committee. Well, the COVID workshop, going back to that, Mike O., Okanowski, Sarah Nayani, Maggie Summer, Mike Berner, Jimmy Anderson, and Dan Wolford were the, the, the leaders of that and putting it together. That was the committee that worked on that. Ment we're working on a mentoring and coaching committee as well, and that to, to help people that after they've gone through MREP, to, to help them on if they have questions and stuff like that. So that's being developed, and that's Heather Mann and Shims Judd and Dan Waldeck and Butch Smith, John Holloway. Sherry Flumerfeld and myself on that committee. And I uh, just wanted to, you know, fill you in on what's going on and more to come. And I hope you enjoy the video when it is shown. And we're, I can't be more pleased and more excited about it. So uh, that, that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks to the council and Noah for doing it. Uh, Butch? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and and uh, I, I, God, Bob did such a great job. I I, I just want to add uh, when when you do watch the video and the audience that's uh, out participating in the council process, there's a, a phone number, I believe, and and websites that you can go to if you have an interest to uh, to contact um, if you want to participate uh, in the MREP program or uh, get, get a hold of one of us. It's, it's a great program. My God, Tuna Tom, he came out of that program. We all recognize Tuna Tom and, and uh, you know, as he testifies before us and, and there's been a lot of people go through that program that's helped understand this process. So I would just like to say um, thank you, you know, to, to the council, PFMC and, and Noah for all their participation. It, it is a really good program. So anyway, that's all Mr. Chairman and, and, and thank you very much. Any other discussion or questions of uh, Chuck on the executive director's report? Anything else, Chuck? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman, that's all I have. All right, great. So uh, let's go to agenda item A4, which is approval of the agenda. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, there was interest in perhaps amending the agenda uh, to move up uh, the legislative committee report so that uh, 
council staff has an opportunity to, or the council and council staff have the opportunity to hear from the advisory bodies and the publics and uh, then to go forward uh, with direction from the council so that the council can approve the letters, presumably, uh, on day last, rather than dealing with all of that on day last. So uh, at this point, um, I will look for um, a motion uh, to approve the agenda and perhaps um, uh, with changes. Uh, Mr. Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everybody. Um, I have a question on the agenda, and it has to do with F4, free gear switching item. Um, and there are, um, the way the council action is worded, and there's also some other verbiage that uh, indicates similar action uh, for the council is to select gear switching level to guide development of the gear switching alternatives. Um, and in the next to last paragraph above the council action, it says, at this meeting, the council is scheduled to identify a level, friends S, of gear switching that will be used to guide so on and so forth. So I think there's some confusion out there, um, and I include myself in that, um, as to whether or not we are, now if we certainly could select a, a one level, but the way this is worded, it also suggests that we may consider identifying more than one level that could be used to guide further development of the action alternatives. And I just wanna make sure that I understand uh, if um, the intent there and whether that flexibility is provided to the council. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, and then my second question relative to your suggestion, uh, Mr. Tracy, on moving the um, legislative committee matter forward in the agenda, uh, I thought I heard you suggest that we may want to move it to Tuesday, April 13th, and I just wanted to confirm that I understood that correctly. Chuck? Thank you. Uh, so to your, to your first question, yes, I believe the flexibility there is, uh, you know, it, it's not just one level uh, if the council sees the utility in identifying more than one level or defining level in different ways i think that is um within its purview so i don't think there's any constraints on on that uh, for the council um for your second question yes i did suggest moving uh, uh, opening legislative matters up on tuesday april 13th my suggestion was prior to moving into the sablefish uh, gear switching issue. So, um, again, salmon is uh, scheduled for first thing that morning. Um, <clears throat> but uh, uh, so, if if that is the case, then uh, then uh, we would. I guess my suggestion was we would proceed with salmon to get that out of the way, so that uh, the analysis and the next iteration can continue. That is the penultimate. Uh, opportunity for changes uh, to the salmon management measures. So <clears throat> that's an important one, but uh, so I think that should have priority, but thought we could uh, deal with the legislative matters prior to getting into a lengthy uh, gear switching uh, issue. Does that answer your questions, Phil? Yes, thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman. And, and with that, uh, um, clarification, I would move that the council adopt the agenda as listed under agenda item A4, April 2021, uh, with the addition of moving H3, the legislative committee matters, uh, to Tuesday, April 13th, uh, following D5, which is 
the further direction for 2021 management alternatives relative to salmon. Well, let's see, it'll give Sandra an opportunity to catch up with you. That looks correct. Thank you, Sandra. And good morning. Is that a language accurate, Phil? Yes, Mr. Chairman, it is. All right, so I'll look for a second. Uh, seconded by Butch Smith. Thank you, Butch. Uh, Phil, do you want to speak to your motion? Uh, I think it's clear. Um, All right. Is there any discussion on the motion? I'm uh, not seeing any hands, so I will call the question. All those in favor of this motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Uh, the motion passes unanimously. Phil, thank you very much for the motion. Uh, is there any uh, any other council business on agenda item A4? Uh, I am not seeing any hands, so that concludes uh, our this portion of our agenda, and we'll move uh, straight into uh, open comment. And I think we will start with an update from the science centers. So Kevin and Kristen. Hey, good morning, Mr. Chair, just testing that you can hear me. Uh, loud and clear. Excellent. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and go first since I've been going first. Um, my name is Kevin Warner. I'm the director of the Northwest Fisheries Science Center, and I'm here to give an update on where we stand with surveys. Let me just preface this by saying this will be very similar to the update I provided at the March council meeting. There will be a couple of new pieces of information around where we stand with vaccines and what that means for our surveys, as well as observers, um, as well as an update on the Hague survey and the status of the Shimada. Um, Kristen, I think we'll get into more detail with that, though, in her report. So with that, I'll just jump into this. And again, you've heard a lot of this before. The Northwest Fisheries Science Center is planning to field our full suite of surveys for the remainder of 2021. I'm going to go through what those are. The first is the, the full four boat 2021 West Coast ground fish bottom trawl survey. This is our annual bottom trawl survey. It's a cornerstone of the Northwest Center's mission to ensure healthy ecosystems with productive and sustainable fisheries as mandated by the Magnuson-Stevens Act. Our top priority is providing long-term time series data for scientific management of West Coast ground fishes and their ecosystem. The survey collects fishery independent data on abundance, distribution, and biology of 90 plus species included in the West Coast ground fish management plan, as well as coastwide environmental sampling and monitoring change within the California current ecosystem. The 2021 ground fish survey will be conducted from Cape Flattery in Washington to the US Mexican border between May 14th and October 22nd. The survey will sample the entire coast using two chartered vessels in for, for pass one, which will go from May 14th to July 23rd, and then in, uh, two separate vessels for pass two that will go from August 13th to October 22nd. Um, our second survey I'll talk about is our Southern California hook rock, no, sorry, our Southern California rockfish hook and line survey. This was um, canceled last year on account of the pandemic. We're planning to conduct the annual rockfish hook and line survey this fall. The cooperative research effort charters three vessels from commercial sports fishing fleet to generate abundance, biological, genetic, and ecosystem information that is used in assessment and management of ground fish species in shelf depths throughout Southern California. The hook and line survey complements the, the bottom trawl survey that I just talked about before by sampling hard bottom habitats and areas of structure that are not easily accessible by trawl nets. This year's hook and line survey is the 17th year in the time series that dates back to 2004. The proposed dates for this year are September 20th through October 8th with mobilization in Oxnard, California and demobilization in Long Beach, California. Our third survey I'll talk about is the Joint U.S.-Canadian Integrated Ecosystem and Pacific Hake Acoustic Trawl Survey. This, is, this will be conducted jointly by the 
the Northwest Center on the NOAA ship Bell Shimada, and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada Pacific Region on the Canadian Coast Guard ship Sir John Franklin. The survey will begin in Newport, Oregon on June 27th, where after calibration of acoustic system, the Shimada will steam south to Point Conception to begin running an acoustic transects. The survey design is primarily 10 nautical mile space transects from Point Conception to the northern end of the west coast of Vancouver Island, and then 20 mile space transects from the northern end of, of Vancouver Island to Dixon Entrance, Alaska. The Franklin will join the survey on August 11th off of Newport and will cover a portion of the U.S. survey area until the two vessels meet again on the west coast of Vancouver Island and conduct the intervessel calibration from August 28th to September 3rd. The Franklin will conduct a post-survey calibration and return to port on September 6th, and the Shimada will finish survey in northern Canada and then steam to Seattle to conduct a post-survey calibration at the end of the survey on September 24th. No, this is the new part that the Shimada is currently awaiting repair in Newport, Oregon, unexpectedly that has disrupted its spring schedule. That said, we expect the Shimada to be repaired soon and are working through the scheduling with other offices in NOAA to ensure that the Shimada is able to maintain its critical role in this year's survey. And as I said, Kristen will have more to say about that. Okay. Um, the next set of surveys are our typical Northern California ecosystem surveys. These surveys collect data on biological, chemical, and physical indicators used to create an ecosystem status report of the Northern California current ecosystem off the Oregon shelf. We successfully fielded a September 2020, last year, survey on Shimada. Unfortunately, as I reported in March, the February survey for, for this was canceled because of severe weather that impacted both the ship's planned operations as well as COVID testing results. Um, given the short duration of that survey, it was not feasible to delay or reschedule that. However, we are looking forward to the, the next iteration of that survey in May and June. Um, in addition to our major surveys I just talked about, we have numerous other small boat and field operations planned for 2021. Um, I want to emphasize that our survey teams are, are diligently researching and planning ways to ensure surveys are accomplished this year. This includes strong safety, this includes strong safety and travel protocols, contingency plans, staffing options, and contract options where necessary for all surveys, and, ma or, and maintaining steady progress on gear readiness. We are also working closely with our assessment team to identify data collection contingencies. Critically, we believe we have the minimum staffing level for all the surveys I just talked about. At this point, we are on track to execute the full suite of Northwest Center surveys planned for the remainder of 2021. That said, things can and do sometimes change. It is possible we will encounter situations such as weather, staff shortages, vessel problems, or other conditions that would force us to reevaluate one or more of these surveys. Um, this part, um, I wanted to say something about vaccines. Um, this is a common question that we get. And I, I, I think I maybe left some confusion at the March Council meeting. I want to emphasize that we are planning to conduct our surveys. Our plans are not dependent on the status of the vaccine. Um, we, are, we are planning to, and we believe we'll be able to execute the full suite of our surveys for the rest of this year with or without the vaccine. Um, that said, I do want to say something about the vaccine. NOAA is an agency continues to encourage employees and affiliates to get vaccinated when offered. Captain Chris, Christian Rathke, who's the director of NOAA's health care unit, um, continues to encourage the NOAA workforce along these lines by saying, quote, the best vaccine is the one that is first offered to you, unquote. In late 2020, NOAA compiled a list of 6,100 critical personnel to prioritize for vaccines. That list is being updated now. The list includes both survey and observer personnel. Um, NOAA also recently issued letters to every person on that list stating their critical role in NOAA's mission to help access state organized vaccine efforts. I want to emphasize again that NOAA has no, vaccine, no access to vaccines itself. Um, vaccine distribution remains primarily a state rather than a federal function at this time. And we want to note that states are welcome to contact NOAA for the full list of an updated list of critical personnel and utilize that list as they see fit. And again, I want to emphasize this, that, that we are continuing to move forward with our plans to execute surveys, regardless of vaccine status for 2021. Um, so we'll continue to keep the council informed on our survey status throughout the year, a regular council meeting such as this one. And um, we expect to have a lot more to say in June as we get into actually executing our surveys. Um, and we stand ready to provide updates um, in the interim. And that is my report, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Um, 
perhaps we'll hear from Kristen and then we'll um, see if there are any questions from around the table. Kristen? Good morning, Chair Grillnick. Can you hear me? Uh, loud and clear. Good morning. Great. Good morning, members of the council. I'm, I'm Kristen Cook. I'm the director at the Southwest Fishery Science Center, and I'll give the Southwest Center a report on surveys this time. So not much has changed, as Kevin has said, uh, regarding surveys for us either since last month, but I'll, I'll go ahead and run through our scheduled surveys. So for 2021, the Southwest has an extensive ship survey schedule that includes five surveys and two partner surveys with a total of 204 days at sea. The winter Cal Coffee cruise um, has uh, been completed. Uh, so we have uh, completed that survey in January and early February of this year on the Ruben Lasker. Uh, Southwest also completes quarterly ecosystem surveys as part of our California Cooperative Oceanic Fisheries Investigations or Cal Coffee program, which has run for 72 years until until last year uh, and is joint with the Scripps Institution of Oceanography and with uh, California Fish and Wildlife. Our first NOAA fishery survey of 2021, the Winter Cal Coffee Survey Board, Ruben Lasker was completed in February, as I said. The spring CPS survey aboard the uh, Ruben Lasker is ongoing now and is scheduled to be completed on April 13th. The survey will complete an acoustic trawl method survey for central substock of northern anchovy, as well as other CPS stocks from central California to the Mexican border. It's also being run in conjunction with nearshore sampling conducted by the fishing industry. The Lasker is currently near Monterey Bay, and early reports from the southern portion of the survey are that sample catches have yielded primarily anchovy with some sardine. As they've moved farther north, they're encountering fewer CPS in general and rougher weather, I understand. Um, but we will have a fuller survey report for the council later in the year once the survey is back and those data have been processed. Spring Cow Coffee Survey, the Spring Cow Coffee Survey was scheduled aboard the uh, Shimada from March 25th through April 18th. However, as Kevin noted, the Shimada is currently still in Newport awaiting a repair. We are hopeful that we can still complete the spring Cal Coffee survey by mid-May on Shimana. There is quite a bit of discussion going on on uh, how long those repairs will take place. On Shimana, we have had to move some things around uh, with other NOAA offices in order to ensure that Cal Coffee will take place, but we are hopeful that the repair can take place as scheduled and we can uh, move the survey to the right and still complete it and still maintain this, the rest of the spring and summer schedule for Shimada. The Rockfish Recruitment and Ecosystem Assessment Survey, uh, the RREAS or Juvenile Rockfish Survey is scheduled aboard the Ruben Lasker from April 28th through June 22nd. For 2021, we plan to resume our normal sampling effort off of Northern, Central and Southern California. For summer, the California Current Ecosystem Survey or our summer CPS survey is scheduled for 86 days on the Ruben Lasker and will be conducted from July 2nd through October 15th, which is a little bit later than normal. This survey is still in the planning stages and permits are being sought. The survey is being planned to extend from Vancouver Island to approximately halfway down the Baja California coast and to be conducted in conjunction with the Mexican government. The intent is to sample for coastal pelagic species along the U.S. West Coast, as ha has been done in recent years, and then continue into Mexican waters to sample transboundary CPS stocks down to about Point Eugenia with the Mexican research vessel Dr. Simone Fraser continuing on to Cabo San Lucas and into the Sea of Cortez. Sampling of, in Mexico is still solely dependent on whether the appropriate permits can be finalized, but it does still look promising, as I reported in March for that to happen. This would be the first time we've ever surveyed in Mexican waters for CPS in conjunction with a similar Mexican survey. Sampling along the U.S. West Coast will also be run in conjunction with nearshore sampling conducted by the fishing industry. Options to find synergies between this CCES survey and the Northwest Center Specific Hake survey for this and future years are being explored. The Summer Cal Coffee Survey is scheduled for July 16th through 31st on the UNAL's vessel Sally Ride, and the Fall Cal Coffee Survey will take place uh, 
end of October to mid-November on the Sally Ride as well, and the plans are are uh, similar as similar to the summer cow coffee survey plans. The ongoing pandemic conditions continue to bring challenges for planning, executing, and staffing surveys. We're putting more effort in than is typical to conduct these surveys, and we'll continue to explore a variety of options and contingencies to support them while complying with NOAA safety pro protocols. We expect to adequately staff our remaining 200, 2021 surveys. What Dr. Werner reported on behalf of Northwest regarding vaccines applies to Southwest Center personnel as well, so I won't repeat that here. As has been happening over the past year, conditions are ever-changing and plans may need to be modified. We will keep the Pacific Council updated with survey activities and status throughout the year as things may change. And as always, we welcome discussion on our surveys. And with that, we'll take any questions. Thank you very, Chris. Uh, thank you, Kristen. Are there any questions of Kevin or Kristen on their reports, which were very thorough? I'm not seeing any hands. Thanks. Thanks very much to the science centers for your reports. Uh, that will take us. Uh, I think that was the only report that I have from management entities and advisory bodies. I have one public comment card completed, I believe, and that is Jeff Shester. Great, thank you. Are you able to hear me okay? Loud and clear, Jeff. Great, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the council. Good morning. Um, uh, wanted to start by uh, uh, commending the, the good news um, uh, presented by Dr. Cook regarding the uh, Mexico a CPS uh, ATM survey uh, that is extremely promising and something that I, I think a, a number of us, uh, it, you know, stakeholders from I think various uh, sectors have all uh, supported, and it is very promising to see that uh, finally happening. So uh, kudos, uh, especially, and, and also kudos for continuing those surveys uh, in light of the the COVID challenges. Um, we have a letter uh, in the briefing book. Uh, under this agenda item, as well as future agenda planning with respect to anchovy management, which isn't on the agenda, uh, but uh, several of the advisory bodies are uh, are looking at that now. Um, uh, we we wanted to um, basically start by saying that we we do believe that the the framework and the the focus on that does have the potential to I think resolve longstanding issues. And, and get us out of what we've been talking about as the, the hamster wheel of, of ongoing litigation over anchovy. Um, we, uh, we believe that um, anchovy is an, an extremely important forage fish, and we've been raising concerns about the, the monitored management regime uh, for anchovy since Amendment 13, and asking for a new assessment and active management since 2013. Uh, and this this uh, concern only was uh, heightened uh, when uh, a number of predators, uh, particularly brown pelicans, uh, were uh, faced unprecedented reproductive uh, failures and mortality events due to the lack of uh, of anchovy and sardine uh, from the 2010 to 2015 period. Um, so we are encouraged that the anchovy framework uh, has you know, has the potential to address this and and move us to uh, I think a, a more robust management system that that uses best available science. Uh, we're encouraged by the the, the framework uh, using the ATM surveys uh, directly in management conducting regular checks to ensure the population is healthy, in which if it is, the, the population could uh, be managed under a constant catch limit and healthy conditions. But the critical piece that is in there is the uh, biomass threshold trigger under which there would be uh, automatic and, and immediate reductions in catch uh, limits uh, to respond to any potential uh, changes in the future that lower the anchovy abundance below a certain trigger. Um, so we uh, we hope to see uh, the council move forward with this. The, this is coming up at the June meeting. Um, the I, I think right now the the framework is is uh, moving toward a really positive place. Uh, however, there still are some some critical undetermined uh, factors, particularly how the framework would be implemented. 
particularly, we've heard different ideas of, uh, for example, specifications would only happen if a, if a threshold was triggered. Uh, but there's not really clarity on who would who would be determining that, and we we would like to see, and we've requested the management team uh, lay out different options for how to implement the framework, uh, including the option we would like to see uh, analyzed and in front of the council to do an annual or, or biennial uh, specifications process. Uh, we think this could be done in conjunction and at the same time in the same rulemaking as. Uh, Pacific Sardine and or Pacific Mackerel, so it wouldn't be an additional rulemaking, but really combined with existing ones to, to minimize additional workload. Uh, but that would provide uh, transparency and clarity so that the council doesn't have, have to ask for a white paper from its management team the next time it wants to make a, a change. Um, and, and it can be very clear to the public and all stakeholders and provide a clear venue for making a determination of whether the biomass is above or below uh, that threshold. So we, we hope to, uh, that, that, you, uh, that you keep this item on the June agenda in hopes that um, this can go into the upcoming CPS FMP uh, amendment that would clarify the management for all the species. Uh, and it could be uh, added and, and, and adjusted the, the, the anchovy framework in the actual FMP itself. So um, we, we hope to see this uh, move forward in future workload planning and wanted again to thank the council for moving in this direction and for the advisory bodies for all their work uh, in, in discussing a new regime to bring anchovy management into the 21st century. Uh, thank you again and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Jeff. Let me see if there are any questions on your public comment. I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you. And, and thanks to all who submitted uh, written comments uh, for the briefing book. That uh, concludes a public comment on the open public comment agenda item. Uh, I, I will pause here to see if anyone from the council wishes to offer anything. And if not, we will move uh, directly into habitat issues, agenda item C1. Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I did, uh, didn't have a question for Kevin or Kristen uh, on the Science Center reports, but I just wanted to comment that I really appreciate the thoroughness on the, the COVID vaccine issue and, and the, uh, the surveys and how, uh, how much um, attention they gave to that and how much uh, clearer it was this this month than it was last month at the council meeting and really appreciate their attention to that and uh, I, I I feel much better this month about the confidence of the surveys. Um, I'm a little concerned about the Shimada's repairs but that is what it is. Boats are boats and um, so but I just wanted to make that comment and thank you. All right thanks for that Bob. All right, before, before we go on to um, Habitat, I just wanna make sure uh, Krista Svensson had audio issues earlier, and I just wanna see if we've resolved those because if it comes time for Krista to ask a question, it will be too late at that time. So Krista, how is your audio? Can you unmute yourself and speak? Okay, I guess we're gonna have to continue uh, to work on Wait, uh, Mark, can you hear me now? Oh, loud and clear. All right, good. I just want to make sure we got that resolved. So. Yeah, perfect. I had me double muted on the phone and the computer, so okay. we're good now. Excellent, excellent. All right, now we are ready to move on to agenda item C1, Habitat Issues, and I will turn to Council Staff Jennifer Gildo. All right, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the Council. Uh, the Habitat Committee met on Tuesday and Wednesday of this week to discuss research and data needs, essential fish habitat for coastal pelagic species, oil rig decommissioning, and other matters. Um, we do have uh, Mr. Lentz Hebden, Chair of the Habitat Committee, here to read the Habitat Report. We do not have any other reports uh, from advisory bodies or management entities. And um, last I checked, there was well, there is no written public comment. So, um, yes, that's, that completes my overview. Right. Any questions for Jennifer? 
And uh, not seeing any hands, uh, I'll ask uh, Lance Hebden to provide uh, the Habitat Committee report. Lance. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, how's my audio coming through? Uh, good morning, Lance. You're loud and clear. All right, thank you. Uh, this is Lance Hebden representing Habitat Committee. I will be reading uh, agenda item C1A, Supplemental Habitat Committee Report Number 1. Uh, first item is Klamath Dam Removal Update. The Klam Klamath Dam Removal Project continues on track toward removal of the four lower Klamath dams beginning in January of 2023. The Klamath River Renewal Corporation, the entity charged with dam removal, recently completed and submitted its biological assessment to the National Marine Fisheries Service and Fish and Wildlife Service. The BA is now being analyzed by the services in preparation for issuing a formal biological opinions and the FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission application process is now complete. FERC's scheduling order for the final NEPA Act process, the only major permitting process remaining before FERC decision on dam removal is expected within the next few months. All relevant FERC and other documents, including detailed implementation plans, are available at KalamathRenewal.org under the tab Resources and Regulatory. Uh, next item on our report is the Kalamath Solicitor General Opinion. On January 14, 2021, then Secretary of Interior David Bernhardt and the Solicitor General's Office issued two solicitors, solicitors opinions that stated that stored water in Upper Klamath Lake should be used only for agriculture, the Klamath Irrigation Project, and thus could not be used for ESA management or tribal trust purposes in support of lower Klamath River salmon runs. Solicitors opinions serve as guidance for interior policies. Therefore, these opinions have strong implications for in-stream flows for salmon throughout the West running directly counter to prior case law and federal water policy and undercutting established tribal water rights. In response to the solicitor's opinion, the Bureau of Reclamation issued a guidance document in January 2021 titled Reassessment of U.S. Bureau of Reclamation Project Operations to Facilitate Compliance with Section 7 of the Endangered Species Act. Together, these documents could greatly reduce the ESA required minimum flows that are essential for survival of downriver ESA listed Southern Oregon, Northern California coho. These flows also support non-listed fall and spring Chinook salmon in the Klamath Basin. Such a reduction in flows could drive these already weakened stocks towards extinction. Based on the problematic opinions, the Klamath Irrigation District filed suit claiming any stored root water release to the lower Kalamath for salmon was in violation of Oregon water rights. They are requesting a cessation of any releases downriver from Upper Kalamath Lake that are above current drought levels inflows to Kalamath Lake. The Hoopa Valley and Yurok tribes have both requested that Secretary Deb Holland rescind these opinions as they abrogate tribal treaty rights. Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Association and the Yurok tribe are also suing to overturn these opinions as flying in the face of ESA requirements, as well as tribal water rights that support Kalamath River salmon runs. The Habitat Committee uh, recommends the Council develop a letter requesting the Interior Secretary withdraw the solicitor's opinions and the subsequent guidance document. In light of clear legal precedent that support the Lower Kalamath River tribal water rights, as well as in-river water obligations, which are necessary to support Klamath River salmon runs under the ESA and other case law. Should the council support such a letter, the Habitat Committee is ready to assist with its production. Due to the timing of litigation, the fast pat track process uh, would be preferable. Uh, next item is offshore wind energy. Efforts to plan and develop offshore wind energy sites on the California coast have been met with both support and some skepticism by the public and California legislature. At a recent public meeting held for fishermen by the California State Lands Commission on proposed wind projects off of Vandenberg Air Force Base, a primary message from the attendees with the two, was that the two proposed projects in relatively shallow waters are unsuitable locations to represent future commercial work. 
In the California legislature, AB 525, a bill requiring agencies to craft a strategic plan to achieve a goal of at least 10 gigawatts of offshore wind installation by 2040, with an interim target of three gigawatts by 2030, was pulled due to concerns that these targets constitute a procurement mandate for offshore wind. In Oregon, House Bill 3375 and House Bill 3391 have been introduced in support of offshore wind. These bills were discussed in the Legislative Committee. Both established a goal of planning for development of three gigawatts of commercial scale floating wind offshore wind projects in federal waters of Oregon by 2030. Oregon House Bill 3391 would require the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife to adopt a program to help commercial and sport fishing industries avoid conflicts with offshore wind. Last item on our uh, report, uh, we have a new Habitat Committee member. Beginning in June, Matt Goldsworthy uh, will be replacing acting member Eric Chavez representing the NOAA Fisheries West Coast region. And uh, personally would like to thank Eric for his work in interim. Uh, lastly, as a summary of the recommendations to the council, the Habitat Committee recommends a fast track letter from the council requesting Secretary Interior uh, Holland withdraw the solicitor's opinions on Kalamath water use. Mr. Chairman, with that, that completes my report. Uh, thank you very much, Lance. Let me see if there are any questions uh, around the table. I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you very much for that uh, report. Uh, that concludes uh, any um, advisory body or management entity reports and takes us to public comment. We have three public commenters, Joel Kawahara, John Polos, and Glenn Spain. So please raise your hands so we can enable your mics. And uh, Joel, please proceed. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Good morning, Joel. I can hear you loud and clear. Uh, th thank you. Uh, for the record, my name is Joel Kawara. I'm a salmon troller from Quilcene, Washington. I would recommend, I would like to offer my support to the Habitat Committee recommendation to the Council that a letter be sent to the Secretary of Interior regarding the solicitor's opinion on uh, stored water for usage for complying with the Endangered Species Act. Uh, the issue goes a, a little bit deeper. There is essential fish habitat involved here for the Klamath River Fall Chinook, which is a managed species, of course, but not an ESA listed species. And um, I would point to the Magnuson Stevens Act under the essential fish habitat provisions that uh, declare that the council shall, um, the council shall comment when there is a likelihood that any federal action would adversely affect anadromous fish habitat. So um, that's the extent of my comment. I'd be glad to answer any questions, sir. Joel, thank you very much. Are there any questions of Joel? Thank you very much, Joel. Uh, Joe Polos. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Council. Um, my name is Joe Polos, and I am the salmon representative of the Humboldt area saltwater anglers, and most of our members primarily fish in the Klamath KMZ. We support the Habitat Committee's recommendation that the Council write a letter requesting the Secretary of Interior to withdraw the solicitor's opinions and reclamation's guidance document considering water management in Upper Klamath Lake. As you are well aware, the poor status of Klamath Basin stocks is severely constraining ocean recreational and commercial fisheries, and actions such as those outlined in the solicitor's opinion and accompanying guidance document will continue to suppress the production of these stocks. Klamath fall, Chinook salmon, natural spawning escapement has not been met in five of the last six years, and as we manage under de minimis fisheries, we're in 2021, it will likely be six of the last seven years. With another low spawning escapement for the Klamath expected this year, severely constrained fisheries will continue into the future until river flows and habitat conditions are improved. The letter to the Secretary of the Interior 
requesting a withdrawal of these documents is needed to reduce the impacts these policies have on fisheries under the council's purview. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on this issue. Thank you, Joe. Uh, are there any questions for Joe? I'm not seeing any. Thanks very much for your comment. Uh, Glenn Spain. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Great. Uh, Glenn Spain. I'm Northwest Regional Director for the Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Associations, and I also support the Habitat Committee's recommendation with regard to the solicitor's opinions. Um, we're not asking in that letter or in that request uh, the outcome of whatever replaces that. Uh, that's up to the solicitor. But I want to point out that there is uh, that this was brought forward by the uh, uh, the tribal representatives on the Habitat Committee. We supported, but it was their initiative to uh, make this request. And yesterday, a, uh, the attorneys for the Hoopa Tribe filed a document that, of course, was too late to uh, put in the briefing book, but we'll put it in in some form. Uh, asking, making that same request. And the conclusion of that extensive document uh, with all of its justification is this. The Klamath stored water memos, if retained, will cause immense harm to Hooper rights and the fish and water resources of the Klamath River. It is a factually and legally flawed document and for the reasons described above, Hoopa requests the prompt and immediate withdrawal of the Klamath stored water memo. Uh, the Yurok tribe has made similar requests and so has PCFFA, but there's a lot on the secretary's agenda. I just want to emphasize the urgency of moving this forward um, because the is issue right now in court is whether or not the Bureau can legally provide the fishing flow, the uh, flushing flows in the climate that are absolutely essential to prevent massive disease outbreaks. Sea Shasta has been a regular problem there. The court has, the, the federal courts have already ordered those flushing flows. Now they are in debate in active litigation. And if we don't do that this spring, we may in fact lose most of this year class to Sea Shasta. So there is urgency here and that's why it is a, a, an emergency a fast track process. Uh, and uh, thank you, and I'd be more than happy to address any questions. Thank you, Glenn. Are there any questions of Glenn? Thank you very much, Glenn. That concludes uh, public comment on habitat issues and takes us to council action, which is to consider the comments and recommendations developed by the Habitat Committee and I will look for someone to get us started. We have a very specific recommendation provided to us that we should address. Uh, Marcy Remco. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just first, um, I'd like to send out a huge thank you to the Habitat Committee for a very succinct yet detailed report of current events uh, surrounding Klamath Dam removal and the situation with the Solicitor General uh, opinions. Um, the topic is obviously of huge concern to many of our uh, agencies that are involved in the council process, as well as um, organizations that um, are active um, in our ranks. So that makes it important for the council as well. Um, this is a great example of the role that the Habitat Committee fills for us uh, to be following along in these um, issues that are kind of outside of our normal domain um, and to bring that expertise to us and report uh, to us on the developments. Um, so I really want to acknowledge um, their work to do that here today. Um, as the report uh, explains, the Hoopa and the Yurok have weighed in with Interior directly 
Uh, and then likewise, PCFFA and the IROC, it sounds like are suing to overturn um, on the basis that the opinions violate existing ESA requirements, along with tribal water rights that support uh, our uh, salmon runs, both for ESA listed stocks, as well as for our um, important uh, Klamath Fall uh, target stock. Um, however, I'm, I'm pausing here um i'm a little i think hesitant to jump in um with a letter from the council uh, on this topic um recognizing they're recommending a quick response process uh and some you know additional homework would probably need to be done um I'm feeling like, um, first of all, there's there's no comment period that we'd be providing a response to. Um, and I, I, I think I would be concerned that a letter from us might suggest that we might be interested in jumping into the litigation that's um, now pending. Um, I also had a chance to check in with our uh, CDFW Office of General Counsel uh, who is very closely following uh, these specific matters, uh, as well as the broader water operations issues in the Klamath Basin. And um, their read was that a letter from the council uh, may not may not be um, useful or necessary at this time. Um, I recognizing that we have. Um, some of our agencies already involved in, in hotly pursuing this issue, uh, as well as um, the litigation that's now pending uh, with PCFFA and the UROC. Um, I, I think I'm comfortable with letting those activities proceed. Um, and, you know, let's, uh, let's stay uh, closely tuned to what, uh, what follows. Um, I appreciate the request and I appreciate how important this issue is, but I, I think I'm a little um, uncomfortable with um, jumping in the fray right now. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, Pete Hassemer followed by Chris Kern. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thanks, Marcy, for those comments. I, I I believe I, I pretty much agree with those, you know, especially with respect to the legal issues that are going on and what our standing would be. Um, at this point, what what's still troubling me, though, is if we have an obligation under MSA to comment on EFH impacts that could result from this federal action, and, and that was brought up in the public comments there. So maybe we have to discuss that a little more. I know the Habitat Committee's um, um, comments here to us did not address in any detail what those EFA, EFH impacts would be uh, that would result from the reduced flows, but that's something I, I think we should consider if there is a Magnuson Act um, obligation to comment on the EFH impacts. But but I agree on the legal aspects of this. I, I'm not sure. I don't believe that's a place where we we weigh in. And and as Marcy stated, that's being addressed by the tribes and the PCFFA so forth. So right now, I I would support the Habitat Committee coming back with um, a, a draft letter that focused on the EFH aspects of that impacts the EFH and it would give us a chance to look at that and um, we still have that decision point then you know the fast track process is in the best way but it's an opportunity to look at that and then make our decision regarding sending or not sending the letter. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Chris Kern, followed by Joe Oatman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? 
I can. Excellent. Thanks. Um, yeah. So uh, I want to echo the comments that I, I definitely appreciate the seriousness of this issue, as well as the Habitat Committee digging into it. Um, and uh, I think it's Marcy and Pete as well uh, captured that. So I, I totally agree. Um, from an Oregon perspective, um, there's, you know, we've got a recent drought declaration in the Klamath Basin from Governor Brown. Um, we all know the water issues and water rights are extremely complex in general. I, I'm not well versed in that. I had to do some scrambling yesterday myself to catch up on this particular issue. Um, something that's not captured, uh, and this is just in the interest of sort of illustrating some of the complexities, some of the things that's not captured in the Habitat Committee comments, nor do I necessarily think it was necessary that they do, is that there is also, and this is not something I'm super familiar with, but I know a little bit, there's also ESA listing considerations in Klamath Lake for listed suckers that are reliant upon water issues and have a treaty, a, a tribal trust uh, nexus as well. And so there's even a third layer to this beyond just the, the sort of Klamath River flows relative to salmon and the needs for irrigation agriculture. There's, there's a third, uh, at least a third layer. Uh, and then, of course, it, you know, it's the West. Water rights are, are uh, pretty complicated, pretty contentious. Um, there is, as has been pointed out, a legal action underway. Um, from my perspective, um, it, it appears there are a lot of folks uh, working this issue, and it seems, you know, reasonably likely to me that it might be resolved with or without a council letter uh, in this regard, but I don't know that. Um, so the, the bottom line for me is it, it's an issue that's being handled by our governor's office and other entities uh, under the direction of the governor's office. So as, as the agencies rep on the council, I'm going to um, not go get in front of them on this issue. Um, but I, I do want to make it clear that doesn't mean I think that uh, it's not an important issue, nor does it imply any support for the action that's occurred so far or anything of the sort. It is simply just that complexity uh, and the fact that it's it's in a legal area now. So interested in some of the conversations, I think what Mr. Hasmer raised might be something that's worth looking into if it's if it's not if it's going to keep us away from the legal part of part of the realm. Uh, and of course, if if uh, if we as a council resolve that that this is or you know something we at, we do need to comment on given our responsibilities, uh, that's fine. I just want to give you uh, some thoughts as to where I'm coming from on it. So I appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Joe Oatman, followed by Sheila Lynch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I appreciate uh, the information uh, that was provided here to the council uh, by the Habitat Committee. I think what I heard uh, in the presentation, as well as in uh, some of the public comment on this matter, uh, that this is an issue uh, that is particularly important to the uh, Hoopa Valley and Yurok tribes, uh, given the uh, issues that it presents relative to um, um, climate river uh, salmon runs, uh, to water rights, uh, to tribal uh, treaty rights, um, and uh, habitat uh, type aspects. Um, so when I uh, look at this uh, recommendation from the Habitat Committee, um, it is requesting that we develop a letter uh, requesting that Interior Secretary Hallen withdraw these two solicitor opinions. Uh, I'm not uh, familiar uh, enough uh, with respect to whether um, the council uh, has done something like this uh, previously or otherwise. Uh, commented or provided letters regarding uh, the climate data removal uh, matter itself. Um, so I think with respect to the uh, issues as it relate to um, the tribes that I represent here on the council, uh, this is something that they do uh, support, uh, I understand. Um, and I would certainly um, uh, I appreciate, um, you know, looking into some of these uh, details that have been pointed out by uh, fellow council members with respect to how this may uh, intersect with uh, MSA, uh, essential fish habitat, and, and uh, 
and what Mr. Kern just mentioned with respect to, um, you know, tribal trust uh, nexus. Um, I think that might be an area that would be uh, particularly important to me in terms of uh, how the, uh, uh, you know, under the MSA for the council, um, the uh, federally uh, recognized rights uh, that uh, tribes have here on the West Coast and those that I represent, um, how that might factor in. So I think I would be um, supportive of, of a draft letter um, that uh, looks at some of those details. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Sheila Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to weigh in on the question that was raised earlier about whether the Magnuson Act um, obligates the council to comment on the solicitor's opinions. I don't believe it does. Um, the, the Magnuson Act refers to activities that would impact EFH and the solicitor's opinions really just state the opinion of, of the solicitor's office on um, the legal landscape. So I don't think those would qualify as activities and I don't think the council has any obligation to comment on them. Uh, Virgil Moore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I've had information provided to me that is from, that says each council, this shall comment on and make recommendations to the secretary and any federal or state agency concerning such activity that in the view of the council is likely to substantially affect the habitat, including essential fish habitat of an anadromous fishery resource under its authority. So I am not a student of the Magnuson Act or the direction to the council but when my when our staff provides that information to me, it suggests that we do have an obligation to make some comments relative to an action that could substantially affect our anadromous fish. Thank you, Virgil. Chuck Tracy. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm just kind of pursuing that a little bit more. Um, I, maybe maybe this is a question for uh, Sheila or, or for NIMS, but uh, so it seems like the question's coming down to whether a solicitor's opinion is a federal action or is the action actually, uh, you know, uh, changing the flows. Um, so maybe that's, that's one question. And then I guess, um, <clears throat> uh, so it, kind of related so at, at some point if there is a federal action then presumably NIMS would be conducting an EFH consultation on that action so um so is is that is there a link there um and and when you know so maybe when would that uh consultation uh occur or under what circumstances would that consultation occur Sheila do you could you respond to Chuck? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I, I'm not up to speed on the details around these particular activities, and you probably need different people to weigh in on the timing and what's expected to occur here. Um, generally, Chuck's characterization is accurate that, you know, at the time there is a federal action um, under contemplation, that would be subject to uh, a consultation under the ESA and uh, probably a associated EFH consultation. But again, I don't, I'm not up to speed on the specifics around the Klamath situation. Frank Lockhart. Yeah. Um... I think uh, I'm, I'm basically going to say the same thing as Sheila. I, I don't know the specific timing of this. Um, I can try to find out um, a, a little bit, but it's not going to be <laughs> in the time that we're still on the, this council agenda. Um, you know, I think uh, maybe I'm uh, misstating this, but I think the council could potentially comment on this. I don't think they have to. 
And as was pointed out, you know, if, if we do go forward with a consultation on this, that there will be other opportunities, but, um, uh, I think I'll just stop there. So I, if it, this is important for the council to come back to, we could potentially find out more details about the timing uh, related to this and get back to the council at some future point in, in the, the, during this meeting. Pete. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Well, on the timing piece of it, yeah, I'm, I'm not aware how that rolls into everything. On the must we or could we, I, I agree based on the language that the council certainly could uh, provide a letter. We have that opportunity. On the should we or should we not piece, I'm, I'm still leaning right now more towards the we should at least review, look at a draft letter and make our decision then. Um, I understand that distinction between opinions and the MSA addressing a comment on activities, but this opinion, um, I would interpret that as an end result of the opinion, it will clearly or most likely result in activities that will affect EFH. And so it's more an issue, should we be preemptive and comment now and highlight the likely effects of actions that would imp be implemented as a result of this or wait till later and comment that actions that are proposed and are likely to be put in place. And so, there's our decision point. And um, if it is appropriate for the council, then I'm favor in favor of being preemptive at this time and at least asking the Habitat Committee to draft that letter that addresses the um, actions that could result from the opinion that would affect EFH and ESA managed species and, and anything else, and then have an opportunity to review that. Um, they're poised to do that. And if we need to put it in the file and save it for a later date when actions occur, then we can do that at that time. So, but I, I would support them providing us with a draft at least at this time. Uh, thanks, Pete. And I'll I'll point out that it's not simply the solicitor's solicit. Let me start over again. The solicitor's opinions, uh, but there's also a subsequent uh, guidance document on uh, uh, actions to be taken there. So I think the difference between an action and a guidance document on action is a, is an awfully fine distinction uh, to be made. Uh, and so um, I think the concerns that I have with the recommendations of the, um, of the, of the Habitat Committee is that, uh, you know, aside from comments on EFH, there is a discussion, uh, you know, wanting to raise um, the issue of legal precedence and taking a legal position uh, on that, and I, I don't think it's, I wouldn't be comfortable with the, with the council doing that, but I do think as, as uh, uh, Joel Kawahara had said, and as, as if you've pointed out, um, Pete, uh, as well as Virgil, that, uh, uh, a, you know, reference to uh, essential fish habitat um, is, is, is probably within our portfolio. Uh, Louis Zim. Well, thank you. Uh, do you hear me, Mark? Uh, loud and clear, Louis. Oh, that's a relief. Thank you. Um, I agree with you, and I agree with with Pete. And uh, and I'm I'm thinking about uh, some of the things that uh, we have responsibilities to. Uh, we we have responsibilities, of course, to the uh, southern resident killer whale situation. Uh, we have responsibilities. We've been talking about uh, this very difficult situation between Oregon and California regarding the Klamath uh, distribution of Chinook stocks in the upcoming season. And we'll, you'll see we'll be re wrestling with that soon enough. 
And uh, so, uh, so I'm very concerned that if we move to not do anything at all, that uh, we may lose uh, confidence of, of some of our uh, stakeholders, uh, especially the ones along that, that uh, coast. And so, so I agree with Pete that, that we should ask um, the Habitat Committee to come up with uh, something that we could review and uh, make the decision whether to send at that time. Thank you. All right, thank you, Louie. Uh, Marcy Aremko. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a, a question here, I guess, of process. So is the thinking that the council will task the HC to draft this letter on a short turnaround timeline and that we're holding this agenda item open to take this up later in the week to consider uh, whether we um, support sending a letter, sending the draft letter or not, so that we would do that as part of an open public council process, um, or or what? I I just I want to make sure I understand what the what the thinking is. Uh, I think that's an excellent question. I think uh, the quick response. Uh, method was mentioned in the Habitat Committee report, uh, and I guess the presumption there is we would not have a draft uh, for council discussion before the end of the meeting, but I don't know if, if that is uh, certain. And I guess I would, um, if Lance is available, to perhaps uh, opine on whether a draft could be available uh, before the end of the council meeting for consideration. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is Lance. Uh, we, if that was the council's uh, direction, we could certainly um, attempt to meet a deadline of which I'm assuming would be next Friday. It wasn't in it wasn't our original intent, but if that's what it takes to um, move this item, um, I'm sure the subset of Habitat Committee that agreed to take the lead on this uh, could meet a short deadline. Well, it, it wouldn't be Friday since the last day of the meeting is Thursday, uh, and we would probably need it in the briefing book by the prior day. So it would be Wednesday. Uh, that's a tight deadline, um, but... Well, you know, I, I don't think... You know, <laughs> uh, um, you could give it a shot if that's the direction. Well, I, I, we don't really have a direction yet. I'm really hoping we'll get a motion on this because uh, I think that there, there've been a, a variety of views presented here and which may not com jibe completely with the recommendation of the Habitat Committee. Um, so I would, for purposes of clarity and efficiency, um, perhaps a council member could put forward a motion providing some particular direction to the Habitat Committee. And if the Habitat Committee can provide us with something before the end of the meeting, then perhaps we can review it. Otherwise, we will use the quick response method as earlier anticipated. Uh, Virgil Moore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll make a, I take a whack at a motion. Um, I move that the council requests the Habitat Committee to produce a letter from the council requesting that Interior Secretary Holland withdraw the two solicitors' opinions on the Klamath water use. I'd further move that if possible, they produce that during this council for our review. Otherwise, we use the fast track method for approval. I know that was a lot, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, that was a lot and it was a little fast. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll watch as it's typed out. There. Yeah, you, you're probably going to have to do some uh, editing after she takes a shot at it here. 
it's the wording that's on the recommendation sheet for on Klamath water use. Further, that the Habitat Committee try to get a draft during this meeting. If not, we proceed with fast track letter. Uh, Virgil, let me ask you uh, before you review the language there, um, those two solicitors opinions resulted in uh, a formal guidance document from the Bureau. Did you wish to have that withdrawn as well? Or... Well, I was reading from the recommendations, but uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe that that would fit very well in there. And so I believe that would be worded, uh, withdraw the two solicitors' opinions and their guidance or the guidance is probably better. All right, is, is the language on the screen complete and accurate? Yes, Mr. Chairman. All right. Uh, let me see if uh, there is a second to this motion. Seconded by Louis Zim. Uh, please speak to your motion as you deem necessary. I believe we've had a fair discussion. I do believe, though, that the council has some important obligations to our responsibilities to at least raise this to the level for understanding of the need for this action. All right, thank you. Are there any uh, any questions for the maker of the motion or discussion? Marcy Remco. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, guess I'll offer my thoughts and potentially follow it up with an amendment. Um, as written, um, I cannot support the motion, uh, given the discussion we had around the table about the legal implications, uh, and the fact that litigation is already pending on the specific topic of withdrawing the solicitor's opinions. Um, I have some discomfort with that being the content of a letter from the council. Um, however, I am, um, I think, interested and supportive of the discussion that we've had surrounding our interest and potential need to comment on the EFH. Uh, situation as you know clearly that is um, a topic that is completely within our domain and there's an expectation of, of council commenting um, on EFH matters of concern and I do I think view the guidance document as potentially being um, uh, a topic that we deem um, affects EFH and therefore we're within um, our right to comment. So I, I think I can get behind the idea of drafting a letter along those lines um, that speaks to our concerns with uh, the guidance document as it pertains to EFH. Um, however, um, I, I think I would, you know, prefer that we steal, steer clear um, of the topic of, you know, withdrawing the solicitor's opinions. Uh, the other thing here that um, I 
need to say a few words about, I want to echo um, what Chris Kern mentioned earlier about um, letting his agency um, and those discussions that are going on um, in different arenas, um, their, their voice, uh, you know, that be the voice of, of his agency uh, in on this topic and, and similarly in California. Um, I know that CDFW is very uh, actively engaged in discussions on this topic, and I would not want to uh, get um, sideways with any of that by sending a somewhat different message uh, out of the council. So um, I feel that it's very important to have the uh, opportunity in the event that this um, draft letter um, says something that um, CDFW can't get behind that um, we have the opportunity to vote no on such a letter. And consequently, uh, that gives me pretty great pause with the concept of moving a letter through the fast track process because of the rules of procedure that govern that process. So um, I'm very much um, interested in seeing a draft letter come back to the council so that we can uh, take it up in open discussion and have a full council vote on whether or not a letter is sent. So I guess with that, I would um, amend, or I would, I would offer an amendment to the motion um, that, um, let's see, we would produce a letter requesting Secretary Holland um, to reconsider those opinions and guidance documents in view of EFH needs. And provide the draft letter to the council for further consideration by Wednesday, April 14th. All right, so what uh, language would be struck under your proposed amendment? Um, Beginning with the word withdraw. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mm -hmm. Mr. Yes. It. Maybe this is a question for our Dave. I don't know if, uh, and I know Dave is available, but uh, I'm just wondering if this would be more appropriate as a substitute motion than, than an amendment to the existing motion. Um, Mr. Chairman, it's not really clear that it's a substitute. I think it'd be better to uh, make the motion, uh, the, the change in the existing motion and go from there. All right, uh, Ms. Uremko, is the language on the screen accurately capture your amendment? Yes, it does. Thank you. All right, I'll look for a second. Seconded by Bob Dooley. Uh, please speak to your amendment as necessary. <laughs> I think I just did. Thank you so All much. Right. Any questions for maker of the motion? All right, uh, Joe Oatman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, question for Marcy to, to clarify. Uh, so, 
with the new language that uh, addresses the EFH needs, does that uh, encompass or not uh, the comment from Virgil Moore on um, on effects on anadromous fish? Mercy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Joe, for the question. I think as um, maybe maybe it was Pete, somebody noted, um, the HC hasn't exactly given us a lot of input uh, or any input on kind of the realm of EFH um, information that they would be um, intending to uh, supply in the in the letter. So I think, you know, in tasking them to develop the letter, um, I mean, what I would envision they would be discussing would be EFH um, as it pertains um, to um, the suite of um, stocks that are in our FMP, which would include uh, the ESA listed stocks. So um, I guess that's just my initial thinking, um, but I, 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 I think I look forward to their their work product um, along these lines, which is another reason I think it's really important that the council have an opportunity to review uh, the draft and discuss it. Thank you. Any further questions? Any discussion on the amendment? All right, I will call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Frank Lockhart abstains. Frank Lockhart abstains. So the motion to amend passes. We're now back to the main motion as amended. <clears throat> if there's any further discussion there. Uh, I am not uh, seeing any hands, so I'll assume there is no further discussion. And I'll call the question on the main motion as amended. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Frank Lockhart abstains. Frank Lockhart abstains. So, notwithstanding that abstention, the motion does pass as amended. And we have clear direction to the Habitat Committee, if they can, to get back to us uh, with a draft letter on Wednesday that we can then take up um, on day last, hopefully uh, not taking up uh, too much time. And, uh, and we'll go from there. We'll see what happens. Uh, Pete Hassamer. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to take a moment here to be sure with both Jennifer and uh, Mr. Hebden, the, the, as chair of the Habitat Committee, uh, the guidance in, or direction here is clear relative to the potential EFH impacts. Um, you know, as, as we said, and, and some of the comments were made, there's not a lot of substance in the, the Habitat Committee's comments, and I understand that. So if there are any questions they have on direction for this, yeah just give them an opportunity to ask us here before they go off and do this. Oh, thanks, Pete. That's an excellent point. So Lance, if you're available, could you let us know whether you need further direction or whether you've got enough to get going? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Member Hassamer, I believe listening to the discussion and reading the substitute motion, we have enough to proceed on. And um, given that the Habitat Committee spent a considerable amount of time uh, on freshwater habitat issues associated with the Kalamath rebuilding plan, I think we've got a good base to tie the EFH concerns into um, the guidance documents and solicitor's opinion. But we will try to be very concise uh, as we develop this. All right, great. Thanks very much. Chuck Tracy. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Just uh, <clears throat> before we uh, move on, I was just uh, going to suggest that we just leave this agenda item uh, open until uh, until such time as the uh, letter 
we get the letter back or the council meeting ends uh, so that we don't have to, so that it fits under the under this agenda item section. All right, great. So we will not close this agenda item. We'll leave it open and we'll have to remember to close it on day last. Uh, anything else, Chuck? No, Mr. Chair. Anything else from around the table on Habitat for now? Uh, Jennifer Gilden, uh, how are we doing here? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think we are, um, we're in a good place. The Habitat Committee has its uh, direction and we'll begin working on that letter to get it into the briefing book um, by Wednesday. All right, thanks everyone. That was a good discussion. And I think uh, we, we are, as, as, as Jennifer said, in a good place. So uh, that will conclude for now, agenda item C1, habitat issues, which will resume on day last. Uh, that will take us to our next agenda item for the day, salmon management. Uh, but before I hand the gavel to Vice Chair Brad Pettinger, we will take our morning break. We'll be back at uh, 11 o'clock.
All right, welcome back, everyone. It's 11 o'clock. Let's get started on our uh, meatiest agenda item of the day, a D1 Salmon Management. And for that, I will hand the virtual gavel to Vice Chair Brad Pettinger. All right. Thank you, Chair Grelnick, and uh, welcome uh, back, everyone. Good morning. Uh, we'll look to uh, Robin Elke to uh, get us started off here. Uh, Robin? Good morning, everyone. This is, again, Agenda Item D1 and the tentative adoption of the 2021 management measures for analysis. The Council adopted three management measure alternatives in March, which were published in preseason Report 2 and sent out for public review. Summaries of the testimony presented at the, council, at the public hearings is provided at the meeting here uh, under Supplemental Reports uh, Agenda Item D1B. Under this agenda item, the Council is scheduled to narrow the management alternatives to a single alternative for analysis by the Salmon Technical Team. To allow adequate analysis before final adoption, the tentatively adopted recommendations should resolve any outstanding conflicts and be as close as possible to the final management measures. Any agreements by outside parties, such as the North of Cape Falcon Forum, to be incorporated into the Council's management recommendations must be presented to the Council prior to the adoption of the tentative options. Procedure also stipulates that any new alternatives or analysis must be reviewed by the STT and the public prior to the Council's final adoption. Management measures considered for adoption that deviate from the salmon fishery management plan objectives will require implementation by emergency rule. If an emergency rule appears to be necessary, the Council must clearly identify and justify the need for such an action consistent with the emergency criteria established by the Council, which is provided under Attachment 1, and the National Marine Fisheries Service, which is provided under Attachment 2. The STT will check back with the Council on Friday, April 9th, under Agenda Item D3 to clarify any questions or obvious problems with the tentative measures. And so your Council action, again, is to adopt the tentative 2021 Ocean Salmon Management Measures for Analysis for your reference materials. We do have preseason Report 2 available electronically on the website and also the two attachments that uh, were mentioned. In addition, there are three supplemental reports under uh, D1B that describe the uh, contents of the public hearings that occurred in Washington, Oregon, and California in March. Under D1C, we do have a report uh, from the PSC that Phil Anderson will uh, update us on. And we have two tribal reports also under D1E, uh, one from the Quinault Indian Nation and another from the Columbia River Treaty Tribes. And finally, we have a supplemental report from the SAS, which is going to describe uh, the uh, or the SAS proposed uh, alternatives for the 2021 season. And we do have, um, through our electronic e-portal, um, public comment that has already been provided, which is uh, uh, available under this agenda item as well. So I think that that concludes my summary of agenda item D1. Thank you, Robin. Uh Question, uh, questions for uh, Robin uh, on our summary before we take off here? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Robin. Next up will be the uh, Salmon Technical Team and uh, Dr. O'Farrell. Mike? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I will be referring to ag agenda item D1A, Supplemental STT Report 1, which uh, contains updated uh, estimated impacts uh, from the March Council meeting. And, but before uh, I get into uh, the contents of uh, D1, I would like to summarize um, what changes to model inputs have occurred since March um, uh, and are reflected in this um, agenda item here. Um, with regard to Chinooks, uh, the Chinook models, we have updated Canadian and Oregon Coast uh, Chinook forecasts. Uh, we have updated inputs for troll and sport fishing uh, fisheries in Canada, and we have updated Puget Sound uh, fishery inputs. 
Uh, for coho, uh, we have updated Canadian uh, 2021 abundances. Uh, we also have updated Puget Sound uh, fishery inputs and updated uh, Columbia River fishery inputs. Uh, one item, one portion of the uh, model inputs that have not been updated yet are Washington Coastal Terminal Fisheries. So at the current time, we are still assuming 2020 uh, terminal area fisheries for uh, some Washington Coast stocks, coho stocks. Um, agenda item D1A uh, displays tables 5A and 5B from the uh, preseason report two updated with the, uh, in, you know, updated as I just described. Um, table 5A uh, represents the QTA uh, uh, treaty troll alternatives and and uh, table 5B uh, um, describes the results for the macaw treaty troll um, alternatives. And I'll just um, hit some of the high points here um, with regard to Chinook, um, the updated inputs resulted in a reduction in um, Lower Columbia River Thule uh, Chinook exploitation rates by just a little more than half a percentage point. Um, but they, uh, under alternative one, and for both uh, for both treaty troll uh, proposals, uh, they the Thule still exceed the 38 uh, percent exploitation rate. Uh, we now, uh, for Chinook, show an analysis, an initial analysis of Puget Sound Chinook impacts. Um, and you'll see that there are a number of areas there that are in bold, uh, indicating the management objectives are not being met. Um, this is not unusual for this time of year, and um, work will be ongoing uh, throughout this meeting to uh, uh, settle in on uh, fisheries that, uh, that meet objectives. Um, additionally, uh, there has been updates to the Southern Resident Killer Whale Prey Abundance Estimates. Uh, they, uh, the changes uh, as a result of these update, this update is are, they're small, um, and you can see them in, the, um, in tables 5A and 5B. With regard to coho, um, uh, Puget Sound exploitation rates increased uh, with changes to the Puget Sound fishery inputs. Um, we see a uh, Skagit exploitation rate exceeding 35% in all three alternatives. And uh, let's see here, uh, LCN coho exploitation rates now include um, uh, river fisheries, and uh, but we're um, doing fine with regard to meeting management objectives for that stock. And I think that um, sums up sums up the high points. Um, you, you know, it's laid out in greater detail, of course, in the um, STT report here, um, but if there are any questions, I can uh, try to answer them. Thanks, Mike. Um, questions for Mike on the uh, team report. Phil Anderson. Phil. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, just um, looking at the southern resident killer whale prey base abundance uh, for the various uh, geographic areas that are displayed there in Table 5A and in 5B, uh, noting that the that the numbers are the same uh, regardless of the alternative, and just double checking to ensure that my understanding that the reason for that is uh, that that is the uh, uh, starting abundance uh, in in the time the step that begins October 1st looking back prior to fisheries is that do I understand that correct or or is the I see there's a there's a or is this the starting abundance we would expect after the fisheries beginning October 1 of 2021 well, uh, thank you mr. Anderson I, I think I'm gonna uh, Refer to John Kerry, uh, Vice Chair John Kerry, on this topic. He's much more familiar with this uh, the killer whale work here. Yeah, John. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thank you, Mr. Anderson, for that question. 
Um, you're you're correct. The, the abundances there that are noted are the basically the pre-fishing October one um, starting abundances. You will note that there are some slight differences in each alternative, and that's um, in a, it's if an effect of the way that the Sacramento fall Chinook abundances are calculated. There isn't one set starting abundance, so we have to back calculate um, from the river return and add in natural mortality and fishery mortalities. And as those shift throughout the year, there's a slight difference in that calculation for each alternative. But uh, in general, they are the October 1 pre-fishery starting abundances. Okay. Oh, Phil? All right, great. Uh, thank you, uh, John, and uh, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Yeah, yeah thank you, Phil. Uh, further questions for the team? Okay, seeing that, um, we'll go into the uh, public hearing reports from the states and the starting at Washington and going down the coast. Uh, uh, Kyle Addix, Kyle? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Can you hear me okay? Uh, we can. Great. So we held our Washington hearing on March 23rd. I served as the hearing officer. Um, council members Phil Anderson and Butch Smith also attended as did Jeremy Jording from NIMPS, Chris German from the U.S. Coast Guard, Dr. Kit Daw from the council staff, and Wendy Beagley from the salmon technical team. Um, had a relatively small crowd compared to some recent years, around 30 participants, including agency staff, and only five people provided testimony at the hearing. Um, three members of the commercial troll industry testified representing both the Washington Trollers Association and the Coastal Trollers Association. In general, they supported the quote, quotas and season structure from alternative one, including the trade of coho for Chinook that was in that alternative. They um, favored the coho TAC from alternative two. Um, in general, they expressed their concerns, a lot of recent poor years for, for ocean fishing and the economic impacts that's had on the coastal communities. Um, testimony was split on the issue of whether to adjust the size limit from 28 inches to 27 inches for the troll fisheries. Also had two um, representatives of the recreational um, industry testify. Similar to the commercial industry, they supported the season structure and Chinook TAC from Alternative 1, but the Coho TAC from Alternative 2. There were a number of written comments um, supplied through the comment portal that reflected the testimony that was given at the hearing. So um, that's all I'll say about the Washington hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, questions for Kyle on his uh, report? Okay. Uh, next up would be Oregon and uh, Chris Kern. Chris? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, yeah, we actually had quite a few participants. I think we had more than we usually do, uh, 63 folks uh, online. So seeing some uh, increased participation maybe uh, via that portal. Um, I, I um, was the hearing officer uh, accompanied by Peggy Monday, Chris German, Rob Nelke, and Craig Foster from the team. Um, had 11 people that provided testimony during the meeting, um, six of those mostly on the commercial troll side, four uh, on the rec side. Uh, had one inquiry about some tribal participation uh, in fisheries. In general, the, there was a bit of a mix on the commercial side. Most folks preferred alternative three, although there were uh, a couple of other alternatives that um, that were mentioned, there was one person who uh, also commented that they did not like the alternative three for north of Falcon area. Um, uh, and then some comments about how the days could be structured um, for the patrol fleet. Uh, in the recreational testimony, um, uh, three folks specifically stated alternative one. I think all the folks that testified were in opposition to uh, alternatives two and three relative to the Chinook periods. Um, and then there was some discussion um, about changing the coho date, specifically delaying an opener to uh, allow for a little more growth on the fish. Uh, but conversely, we also had some folks, uh, at least one person say that they preferred the earlier start to provide as much access to the hatchery run as, as we can. Um, and I'll just note, uh, I think there's, there's quite a bit of testimony in the briefing book relative to the Oregon areas. 
um, a lot of it consistent with what I just mentioned, particularly on the recreational side. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that unless there's questions. Very good. Thank you, Chris. Uh, questions for Chris on the Oregon report? Okay. We'll move down the coast to California and uh, Brett Cormos. Brett? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, California held uh, our public hearing on March 23rd. Uh, I was the hearing officer for that meeting. Uh, we had uh, Ms. Peggy Mundy in attendance for the National Marine Fisheries Service, Ms. Robin Elke uh, with council staff, and Mr. Alex Letvin uh, with the team. Uh, we did not ultimately have a representative from the Coast Guard uh, able to make it to that meeting. We had a, a 65 participants that included the representatives, representatives I listed, um, plus a handful of other agency staff and, uh, and some council members. A uh, total of 14 people provided testimony, uh, six on the commercial troll fishery and eight on the recreational fishery. Uh, in all, the, the testimony could really just be summarized by uh, a few key points. Uh, everyone wanted as much time on the water as possible this year. There was support uh, for full utilization of fall fishery opportunity in 2021. Uh, and the recreational fishery, uh, or excuse me, uh, testimony also asked for uh, a day to be added at the end of the season in the California Klamath Management Zone such that uh, that that season closes on a Sunday instead of a Saturday so that they get the full weekend. Uh, there were others there were a handful of other comments on other items. Uh, one person was in the troll fishery uh, would like to see a lower size limit uh, 26 instead of 27 inches um, and there were some uh, folks who expressed willingness to uh, engage in five day per week fisheries during the fall as opposed to uh, full week fisheries from September 1 through the end of September. So I will conclude there and, and take any questions should there be any. Right. Thank you, Brett. Questions for uh, Brett's report? Okay. Thank you. Um, next, we'll go to the uh, Pacific Salmon Commission report and um, Phil Anderson, Phil. Thanks, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, you may recall in March, I gave an update on the Pacific Salmon Commission's uh, doings, uh, particularly with respect to their uh, meeting held in January and the, another one in February. I also gave you an overview on the updated spending plan that we have uh, for uh, implementation of the treaty in March that included um, an uh, increase in the amount of money that was being put forward relative to increasing the prey base for southern resident killer whales. Uh, so I won't um, go, through, go through any of that again. Uh, you may also recall that I uh, made mention of, of the fact at that time that our Chinook Technical Committee would be working uh, here in the latter part of March doing the, the work that's associated with um, model calibrations that produce um, uh, both abundance indices and uh, catch ceilings for the remaining two areas that are managed under an aggregate abundance based management system. Uh, you should uh, have, and I, I believe Robin, Robin referenced this and uh, uh, Michael did as well, the, the use of the information that is in here, uh, a um, memo that the Pacific Salmon Commission received from our, our co-chairs of the Chinook Technical Committee dated April 1, 2021. Uh, that uh, memo includes the results of the calibration that was done for the 2021 preseason abundance indices that again are used for determining the allowable catches 
in northern British Columbia troll and Haida Gwaii sport fisheries, so the northern BC, uh, and the west coast of Vancouver Island troll and outside sport fisheries, which we commonly refer to as WCVI. Um, the uh, allowable catches for the southeast Alaska fisheries had already been determined through a separate process. Um, um, uh, that includes uh, catch per unit of effort uh, data from the uh, winter uh, troll fishery in southeast Alaska. You will see the results of this relative to the uh, preseason um, uh, catch limits that are for each one of the three areas in, on the top of page two of that memo. In table A, you can see for CAT for southeast Alaska, the 205165 which is tier four. Uh, the Northern BC uh, number is 153,800 and the West Coast of Vancouver Island is 88,000. Uh, this information was shared with the members of the salmon technical team. And as I believe Dr. O'Farrell noted, uh, they have updated uh, the FRAM model uh, with these values. So uh, we now uh, have this part of the puzzle complete. Press Chairman, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions. Uh, Danny Evanson from Alaska Department of Fish and Game is also uh, with us, uh, um, one of my colleagues in the Pacific Salmon Commission Forum. So if there are any questions, uh, we'd be happy to try to answer those. Yeah, thank you, Phil. And before we go to questions, hey, Danny has her hand up. And uh, Danny, do you... Uh... Um, is that for questions, or do you uh, want to speak to the council? Yes, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair and Mr. Anderson, for providing the Pacific Salmon Commission report faithfully. Uh, I just wanted to make a few brief additional comments, uh, if that's all right. Uh, firstly, I just want to say that it was no small feat that the Pacific Salmon Commission was able to get this model output to you in time to support pre-season fishery planning processes. With new in-person meetings for the second year in a row, this was a big struggle uh, for the Chinook Technical Committee. They were challenged to get the requisite model input data to run the model and error check the output. Late in the process, errors were identified and corrected to provide the best results available at the time. That's reflected in the memo uh, that you have before you. However, um, some concerns remain regarding the ability of the model to perform with the very low catches observed along the coast last year to COVID. This was something strange uh, and new and it was flagged. Those concerns were largely coming out of Alaska, admittedly, where um, models based on empirical data didn't align well with the Pacific Salmon Commission model output. The Chinook Technical Committee recognized the need to get the data out by April 1st to support uh, pre-season planning and did everything they could to make this happen uh, through rigorous review of the model within the time constraints given and active discussion within the CTC, the Chinook Technical Committee. They were able to reach consensus on reporting the numbers and agreed to continue evaluations of the model in the coming year. The model is the foundation of Chinook salmon management between the US and Canada, and we intend to be diligent in our efforts to ensure that issues identified are addressed and that the model continues to provide the best estimates possible. I wanna take just a, a quick minute to acknowledge the efforts of the Chinook Technical Committee this year to bring before us these numbers that are integral to the salmon planning process. And I would be remiss if I didn't recognize specifically the efforts of John Kerry, who as co-chair was instrumental in bringing the Chinook Technical Committee to uh, consensus. So kudos to John. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair. Yeah, thank you, Danny. Uh, questions for uh, Danny or Phil um, on the Pacific Salmon uh, Commission uh, recommendations? Okay. Uh, seeing no hands, um, thank you all. Uh, we'll go to um, Joe Oatman in the uh, tribal report. Joe? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. 
for the council, we have two uh, travel reports that will be presented. Uh, the first travel report will be the te testimony of the Quinault Indian Nation. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the representative uh, from the Quinault who was to provide this uh, is unable to do so. And so I will um, uh, read that into the record uh, per their request. Uh, the second travel report will be the testimony of the Columbia River Treaty Tribes. And I understand that we will have Wilbur Stockish from the Yakima Nation providing that. And with that, uh, Mr. Vice Chair and Council, um, I will proceed with uh, report one. And after uh, that concludes, um, I will call upon uh, Wilbur Stockish uh, to provide the uh, travel report to you. Sounds good. Thank you. So uh, this first travel report is uh, the supplemental travel report one. This is the testimony of the Quinault Indian Nation, the analysis of preliminary range of ocean fishery alternatives for coho salmon. The 2021 ocean abundance forecast for Quit's natural coho prior to fishing of 3,919 is 32% below the 5,800 lower end of the spawning escapement goal. Given this projection, Queen's natural coho spawning escapement would fall below the lower end of its spawning escapement goal for seven consecutive years. Precautionary management actions should be taken in all 2021 fisheries in order to reduce the risk of fisheries significantly contributing to a perpetuating chronic or cyclic depression of the stock. Although poor marine survival conditions are a primary contributing factor to the low abundance of the stock, smoke production has been significantly depressed as well, likely due to low spawning escapements. The Pacific Fishery Management Council has a shared responsibility with the co-managers to ensure the Queets Natural Coho Rebuilding Plan is successful. We request that decision making by the council and co-managers be informed by full disclosure and transparency of uncertainties regarding abundance forecast and projections produced by the fishery planning models like FRAM. All of the 2021 salmon management alternatives coupled with last year's terminal area fisheries exceed the maximum, maximum allowable exploitation rate of 20% for southern coho management units in low status under the Pacific Salmon Treaty Southern Coho Agreement. The minimum spawning statement for Queen's Natural Coho needs to be 3,150 fish in order to achieve the low status exploitation rate cap. Equitable sharing of the conservation responsibility is required. Queen's River terminal fisheries are expected to be severely curtailed targeting primarily early time hatchery coho production. The cumulative impact of Southern US ocean fisheries needs to be limited to allow for these terminal area fisheries to occur without disproportionately shifting the risk associated with forecast and management and precision to the terminal area. Commitments are needed by co-managers and other partners to address the chronic depressed status of Queen's natural coho we look forward to working with the Pacific Fishery Management Council to develop 2021 fisheries within weak stock constraints and to advance support for future actions to improve production of Queen's natural coho. With that, Mr. Chair, that uh, concludes um, this travel report. Thank you, Joe. Um, questions for uh, Joe on travel report one? Okay, seeing none. Thank you. Um, next, we'll go to um, Wilbur Slockish and the uh, uh, Columbia River. Uh, Wilbur, are you there? Yes, I am. There's no hand raised on uh, my uh, screen there. So I send a chat. I hope you can hear me. If you can, uh, I don't know yet. We can hear you fine, Wilbur. Okay. All right. Uh, good day, members of the council. My name is Wilbur Slockish Jr. I am a member of the Yakima Nation and a commissioner with the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission. I have lived and fished along the Columbia River for all my life. 
I have been asked to provide comments today on behalf of the four Columbia River Treaty Tribes, the Yakima, Umatilla, Warm Springs, and Nez Perce Tribes. As the, as the council works to finalize the 2021 ocean fisheries, we have some concerns relative to Columbia River stocks, specifically their relationships between ocean and Indian River fisheries and some Indian River fisheries share the allowed harvest rates on stocks such as the Lower River Hatchery Tules and Lower River Columbia Co uh, Coho. This means that in river fisheries, in river fisheries have a bearing on ocean fishery planning. In past years, we have voiced our opposition to summer season mark selective fisheries. Main steam fall selective fisheries, uh, mark selective Chinook fisheries, mark selective coho fisheries, and ocean mark selective fisheries. This year, we understand that there is a proposal for a mark selective recreational fishery in August at Buoy 10. We provided some comments at an earlier state planning meeting expressing our opposition to mark selective fishing at Buoy 10, which we thought would uh, appropriate to, re to repeat for the entire council. Mark selective fishing at Buoy 10 is an unwise proposal for several reasons. First, estu estuaries are a poor choice as an uh, area for mark selective fisheries. The fish are making complex changes to adapt from salt fresh water. And there is evidence that release mortality may increase in these areas. There can be a sharp temperature difference between ocean and river temperatures that can be 70 degrees or more in August. This temperature, tra temperature transition may put fish at risk for higher release mortality. Second, we have lower than average upriver fall Chinook forecast. The Spring Creek Hatchery Thule forecast is only about two thirds of the 10 year average run size. This run has returned lower than forecast in several recent years, sometimes by a significant amount. A, a mark selective fishery at Buoy 10 will increase impacts to the Spring Creek and pub runs compared to a full retention fishery because these fish are almost all ad clip. An average of only 26% of the river run mouth returned to, of Spring Creek tules make it to the hatchery, and the percentage can be as low as 17%. Typically, the tribal fishery harvests around 39% of the Spring Creek tules entering the river. An average of only 14% of the pub return to the river mouth reaches Little White Salmon Hatchery. And, it, and tree to harvest is normally above 20%. We need good runs of tulies and pubs so we can, can maintain our overall fishing plans targeting river bites. If these runs come in less than forecast and we have difficulty meeting broodstock needs, it can cause problems from managing the treaty fishery. We don't want to face this risk because of non-treaty fishery decisions. We think it would be appropriate for the STT to report expected hatchery escapement for Spring Creek and the Little White Salmon National Fish Hatcheries. Tribal staff are willing to assist them in providing information on expected treaty harvest rates that would be needed to do this. The privilege for non-Indians to buy licenses to engage in recreational or commercial fishing should not come before the treaty rights of our tribes. These hatcheries were intended to produce, to make up 
for damage done by the hydro system and other developments. The, prom the tribes were promised we would have fish from these hatcheries to catch in our fishery. Their purpose is not to just increase recreational harvest in mark selective fisheries. The third reason that it is likely the ocean fishery just out of the buoy 10 fishery will have re re regulation allowing the retention of unclipped Chinook. This could cause enforcement concerns with different retention rules in adjacent areas. And the fact that ocean fishers will be transiting through the buoy 10 fishery. It is possible people may try to fish in both of these areas as well. We would not like to see an incentive put in place for buoy 10 fishers to keep an unclipped fish and claim it was caught in the ocean. There is only a short distance between the ocean management area and the buoy 10 area. And if the weather and tides are good, it is easy to go between these areas. Fourth, a mark selective fishery won't do anything to reduce impacts to ESA listed stocks and non-treaty non fisheries. The only thing it will do is to shift impacts from landed catch to release mortality. It will increase wild impacts in upstream fisheries, including both the mainstream treaty fisheries and tributary treaty fisheries and non-treaty fisheries because of changing mark rates from the select fisheries. It, it appears that the main justification for this proposal is, is to simply extend the buoy 10 fishery to go through Labor Day. If this is such an important goal, then it seems like it would be more practical to the start the buoy 10 fishery later so that it can go through the desired date and let people keep and eat the fish they catch. Fish were provided by the creator as a source of food for willing to take care for the salmon. We are not showing we care for these fish by hooking them, injuring, and tossing them back. This concludes our statement. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Wilbur. Um, questions for Wilbur on the uh, tribal testimony? Uh, Bush Smith, Butch? Yeah, Wilbur, thank you uh, for your thoughtful testimony. And um, uh, we, we too uh, have a have a little concern with uh, potential of mismarking uh, of the fish. And I, I, I do believe that uh, it, it probably both ODF and W and WDF and W are currently working on that. Um, but, but, you know, for the ocean fisheries to have uh, potential of mismarked fish being caught in the ocean, caught in a different area is, is problematic uh, for us all in the future. So, um, let's work on this together, Wilbur, and, and uh, see if we can uh, get something, um, get some remedy for this before, uh, before it opens up. So thank you once again for your testimony, Wilbur. Okay. Thank you, Butch. Uh, further questions for Wilbur? Okay, seeing none. And thank you, Wilbur. Really appreciate your, uh, the tribe's uh, uh, testimony, and, uh, and uh, thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Okay, um, and with that, we'll go to the SAS report, and I believe uh, um, Megan uh, Megan Waters will be giving some uh, opening remarks. Megan, thank you very much to uh, the council. My name is Megan Waters, and I will be introducing the Sam Advisory Sub Panel Report One. Proposed 2021 Ocean Salmon measure, Management Measures for Tentative Adoption. The SAS has been working with our STT colleagues over the last few days to come up with these uh, proposed measures. And we will be starting out with the Washington Troll. And my, uh, my SAS colleague, Ryan Johnson, will be kicking off our report today. Thank you. 
All right, thank you, Megan. So with that, we'll go to uh, Mr. Johnson, right? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'll be reading Table 1, North of Falcon, the overall non-Indian tack of 59,000 Chinook and 110,000 March Coho, the non-Indian troll tack of 30,300 Chinook, 14,400 March Coho, commercial troll traded, 3,200 mark coho to the recreational fishery for 800 Chinook. Overall Chinook and coho tax may need to be reduced or adjusted to meet requirements for the fishery prior to May 16, 2021. See management measures from 2020, which are subject to in-season action and the 2021 season described. May 16 through the earlier of June 29th or 18,180 Chinook no more than 6,710 of which may be caught between the Canada border and the Queets River. No more than 4,960 of which may be caught between Leadbetter and Falcon. In the areas between the Queet, uh, Canadian border and the Queets River and the area between Leadbetter and Cape Falcon, there's a landing and possession limit of 75 Chinook per week. Fisheries open seven days a week. All salmon except coho. Chinook minimum size is 27 inches. When it is projected that 75% of the overall Chinook guideline has been landed, or 75% of any sub area guideline, <clears throat> in season action will be considered. In 2022, season will open May 1, consistent with all preseason regulations in place uh, during May 16 through June 30 of 2021. This opening could be modified following council review at the March or April 2022 meetings. <clears throat> July 1 through the earlier of September 30th, 12,120 Chinook or 14,400 marked coho open seven days per week. All salmon except uh, no chum north of Alava in August and September. Chinook minimum size 27 inches, coho minimum size 16 inches. Um, coho must be marked. Landing possession of 50 marked coho per week. Um, <clears throat> this last section here contains the common closure areas and conservation areas, as well as call-in requirements when you move between fishery zones, and, and also certain call-in requirements for specific ports of landing. And that, that concludes North of Falcon Troll. Sorry, I'm, I'm my, I was muted. Um, questions for Ryan? Okay, next to Darius Peak. Darius? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair and Council Members. My name is Darius Peak, Oregon Control SAS. I'll be reading from the 2021 Commercial Troll Management Measures for Non Indian Ocean Salmon Fisheries, page three. Season descriptions, Cape Falcon to Hecate Bank Line, March 20th to April 30th, May 1 to 31, June 5 to 7, 12 to 14, 19 to 21, 26 to 28, September 1 to October 31. All salmon except coho, except as described below, Beginning September 1, no more than 75 Chinook allowed per vessel per landing week, Thursday through Wednesday. Chinook minimum size limit of 28 inches total length. All vessels in the area must land their salmon in the state of Oregon and see the gear restrictions and definitions. July 5 through 7, 12 through 14, 18 through 21, 26 through 28, and August 1 through 3, 6 through 8, 11 through 13, 16 through 17, or 10,000 mark coho quota for the combined area from Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain. All salmon all retained coho must be marked with a heeled adipose fin clip. Salmon trollers may take and retain and possess on board a fishing vessel no more than 20 coho per vessel per week, Thursday through Wednesday. All coho retained possessed 
on a vessel must be landed and not exceed a one-to-one -one ratio with Chinook salmon that are retained and landed at the same time. Coho size limit of 16 inches total length and Chinook minimum size limit of 28 inches total length. All vessels fishing in the area must land their salmon in the state of Oregon. See the gear restrictions and definitions. In 2022, the season will open March 15th for all salmon except coho. Chinook minimum size limit of 28 inches total length. Gear restrictions same as 2021. This opening could be modified following council review at this March 2022 meeting. Ekata Bank Line to Humbug Mountain. May 1 through 31, June 5 through 7, 12 through 14, 19 through 21, 26 through 28, September 1 through October 31. All salmon except coho, except as described below, beginning September 1, no more than 75 Chinook allowed per vessel landing week, Thursday through Wednesday. Chinook minimum size limit of 28 inches total length. All vessels fishing in the area must land their salmon in the state of Oregon and see the gear restrictions and definitions. July 5 through 7, 12 through 14, 18 through 21, 26 through 28, and August 1 through 3, 6 through 8, 11 through 13, 16 through 17, or 10,000 mark coho quota for the combined area from Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain. All salmon, all retained coho, must be marked with the healed adipose fin. Salmon trollers may take or retain or possess on board a fishing vessel no more than 20 coho per vessel per week, Thursday through Wednesday. All coho retained, possessed on a vessel and landed must not exceed a one-to-one -one ratio with Chinook salmon that are retained and landed at the same time. Coho minimum size limit of 16 inches total length and Chinook minimum size limit of 28 inches total length. All vessels fishing in the area must land their salmon in the state of Oregon. See the gear restrictions and definitions. In 2022, the season will open March 15th for all salmon except coho. Chinook minimum size limit of 28 inches total length. Gear restrictions same as 2021. And this opening could be modified following council review at its 2022 meeting. Humbug Mountain, the California border, Oregon, California border, the Oregon KMC. From March 20th to May 31, June 1 through 30, or the earlier of 300 Chinook quota. July 1 through 31, or the earlier of 200 Chinook quota. All salmon except coho. Chinook minimum size limit of 28 inches total length. See the compliance requirements and your restrictions and definitions. Prior to June 1, all salmon caught in this area must be landed and delivered in the state of Oregon. June 1 to July 31, weekly landing limit and possession of 20 Chinook per vessel, Thursday through Wednesday. Any remaining portion of the Chinook quotas may be transferred in season on an impact neutral basis for the next open quota period. All vessels fishing in this area during June and July must land and deliver their all salmon within, within this area into Port Orford within 24 hours of any closure of this fishery and prior to fishing outside of this area. For all quota managed seasons, June and July, Oregon State regulations require fishers to notify ODF and W within one hour of landing and prior to transport away from the port of landing by calling 541-857-2538 or sending the notification via email to KMZOR Troll Report, State of Oregon, US, with the vessel name and number, number of salmon by species, location of delivery, and the estimated time of delivery. In 2022, the season will open on March 15th for all salmon except coho. Minimum size limit of 28 inches total length, Gear restrictions are the same in 2021. Any opening could be modified following council review at this March 2022 meeting. Any questions? Yeah, thank you, Darius. I'm um, sorry. I, I, I actually asked for questions after um, Ryan there. I, I uh, we'll just go ahead and just finish up the SAS report and go to questions then. So thank you, and I'll just turn it over to John, and you guys can finish it out. So thanks. 
Good morning, Mr. Uh, Co-Chair. This is John Cabin, California Troll. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, we can. Thank you. I will start with the uh, Oregon to California border to Humboldt South Jetty, California KMZ, uh, which is closed. The boiler, the boiler point or boiler plate uh, language remains the same as the uh, uh, March alternatives. Humboldt South Jetty to Southern KMZ boundary is closed and that boiler point, boiler plate uh, language remains the same. Southern KMZ boundary to Point Arena, also known as the Fort Bragg Management Zone, August 1st through the 16th, and September 1 through the 30th. All boiler plate language remains the same. Point Arena to Pigeon Point, also known as the San Francisco Management Zone, June 15 to the 30th. July 16 through the 22nd, August 1 through the 16th, September 1 through the 30th. The uh, boiler, boiler plate remains the same. The uh, point raised to San, Point San Pedro, also known as the uh, fall target area, is October 1, October 4 through the 8th and October 11th through the 15th. And uh, that boilerplate remains the same as well. And finally, the uh, Pigeon Point to US Medi uh, Mexico border and also known as Monterey Management Zone, May 1 through the 13th, 20th through the 27th, June 15 through the 30th, July 16 through the 22nd, August 1 through the 16th, and boilerplate remains the same as in the uh, March alternatives. And I believe that concludes the uh, commercial um, regulation read. Any questions, please? Yeah, we're going to finish up the SAS report and then come to the questions afterwards, John. So uh, thanks on that. We'll, we'll start off the recreational guys and they can take it, uh, take it down the coast from there. Thank you. So it'd be Dave, uh, Dave Johnson, I believe, is uh, next up. Dave? Good morning, Mr. Vice Chair. Can you hear me okay? Uh, I can. Okay. Good morning, members of the council. For the record, my name is Dave Johnson. I am the SAS Washington Rec Rep. I will be reading from table two, page 10 and 11, the overall non-Indian tech of 59,000 Chinook and 110,000 marked coho with a heeled adipose fin with a recreational tack of 28,700 Chinook and 95,600 marked coho. All retained coho must be marked. There is a trade with commercial troll traded 3,200 marked coho to the recreational fishery for 800 Chinook, and this was agreed on by all parties. No Area 4B add-on fishery. The U.S.-Canadian border to Cape Alava, Nia Bay sub area, open June 19th through July 3rd, open seven days a week, all salmon except coho, one salmon per day, Chinook minimum size limit of 24 inches total length. See gear restrictions and definitions. Open July 4th through earlier of September 15th or 7,860 marked coho sub area quota with a guideline of 6,100 Chinook. Open seven days a week. All salmon except no chum beginning August 1st. Two salmon per day. All coho must be marked with a heeled adipose fin. Chinook minimum size limit is 24 inches. Coho minimum size limit is 16 inches. Cape Alava to the Queets River, other words known as La Push sub area, open 
June 19th through July 3rd, open seven days a week, all salmon except coho, two salmon per day, Chinook minimum size limit of 24 inches, sea gear restrictions and definitions. Open July 4th through earlier of September 15th, or 19,070 marked coho subarea quota with a subarea guideline of 1,400 Chinook. Open seven days a week, all salmon except no chum beginning August 1, two salmon per day. All coho must be marked with a heeled adipose fin. Chinook minimum size limit in this area is also 24 inches. Coho is 16 inches. Queets River to Ledbetter Point, Westport subarea. Open June 19th to June 26th, open seven days per week. All salmon except coho, one salmon per day. Chinook minimum size limit in this area is 22 inches. June 27th through earlier of September 15th, or 27,970 marked coho subarea quota, with a subarea guideline of 13,600 Chinook. This area is open five days a week. Sunday through Thursday, all salmon, two salmon per day, no more than one of which may be a Chinook. All coho must be marked with the heeled adipose fin. Chinook minimum size limit in this area is 22 inches, coho 16. Let better point to Cape Falcon, Columbia River sub area. June 19th through the 26th, open seven days per week, all salmon except coho, one salmon per day. Chinook minimum size limits 22 inches. June 27th through earlier of September 15th, or 57,800 marked coho subarea quota, or a subarea guideline of 7,600 Chinook, open seven days a week, all salmon, two salmon per day, no more than one of which may be a Chinook. All coho must be marked with a heeled adipose fin. Chinook minimum size limit 22 inches, coho minimum size 16 inches. And that concludes my report. Thanks, Dave. And now to Mike Swanson for Oregon and then to uh, James Stone for California. So, Mike. Uh, good morning, uh, Co-Chair. Uh, can you hear me? I can. You're good. Okay. I just messed up and lost my report. So hold on a second here. Uh, I'll be reading from the uh, same uh, as everybody else was, and I'll be reading on... Uh, Page 12, from uh, Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain, March 15th to October 31st, open for all salmon except coho, except as listed below for the mark select and non-selective coho seasons, June 12th through August 28th, or 120,000 mark coho quota, open area extends to the Oregon-California border, open for all salmon, all retained coho must be marked with a hilt adipose fin clip. September 10th through the 12th in each Friday, Saturday, Sunday through the earlier of September 30th or 14,000 non-marked select coho quota. Open for all salmon. Open days may be modified in season. Two salmon per day, sea minimum size limits, sea gear restrictions, definitions, any remainder of the mark select coho quota may be transferred in season on an impact neutral basis to the non-select coho quota. In 2022, the season will open March 15th for all salmon except coho, two fish per day, Chinook minimum size limit of 24 inches total length in the same gear restrictions as 2021. The open could be modified following council review at its March 2022 meeting. Humbug Mountain to the Oregon-California border or the KMZ, June 12th through the 18th, open for all salmon except Chinook. All quota must be marked with a hilled adipose fin clip. June 19th through August 15th, open for all salmon, all coho must be marked with a hilled adipose fin clip. Coho retention, closes when the Cape Falcon to Oregon, California border quota of 122,000 coho is retained. August 16th through the 28th, 
open for all salmon except Chinook. All salmon fishes closes in the area earlier of August 28th or the Cape Falcon to Oregon, California border quota of 122,000 coho. Open seven days per week, two salmon per day, see minimum size limits and gear restrictions. And that uh, concludes my report. Okay. And uh, James Stone, James? Thank you, Vice Chair. My name is James Stone and I'm the California Sport Rec and I will be reading from the D1 Supplemental Report on page 13, table two, page four of six. I will start in the north, the Oregon-California border to the southern KMZ. The seasons will be June 28th to July 31st. The same boilerplate information, open seven days a week, all salmon except coho, two salmon per day. Chinook minimum size of 20 inches. See gear restrictions and definitions and the same boilerplate information as March. In 2022, the season opens May 1st for all salmon except coho, two salmon per day, minimum size limit of 20 inches, same boilerplate information as March. Moving to the south, to the southern KMZ boundary to the Point Arena, Fort Bragg, the season will be set on June 28th to October 31st, open seven days a week, all salmon except coho, two salmon per day, Chinook minimum size of 20 inches in length, and the same boilerplate information as March. In 2022, the season opens April 2nd for all salmon except coho, two salmon per day, Chinook minimum size of 20 inches, entirely the same boilerplate information as March. Moving to the south, the Point Arena to Pigeon Point, San Francisco zone. The season dates will be June 28th to October 31st, open seven days a week, all salmon except coho, two salmon per day, Chinook minimum size of 20 inches, same boilerplate information as March. And in 2022, season opens April 2nd for all salmon except coho, two salmon per day, Chinook minimum size of 24 inches total length, following council review, same boilerplate information as March. And moving to the south, Pigeon Point to U.S.-Mexico border in Monterey, April 3rd to September 30th, open seven days a week, all salmon except coho, two salmon per day, Chinook minimum size of 24 inches total through May 15th, and 20 inches total thereafter. Same boilerplate information as March, and in 2022, the season will open April 2nd for all salmon, uh, Chinook minimum size of 24 inches. And that concludes my report for California Rec. Okay, thank you, James. And um, before we go to questions, I'd like to go to uh, Robin Elke for some clarification uh, on the uh, um, for Oregon um, for Darius uh, Peak's um, uh, testimony or report. Uh, Robin. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, not a super big deal, but in case there was any confusion, I just wanted to confirm that what was read into the record uh, for the Oregon troll um, from your uh, table one, looks like it's page four of the um, packet, uh, it, what was read into the record was correct. Um, Initially, we had a draft that had the, the Cape Falcon to Hecate Bank line and the Hecate Bank line to uh, Humbug. The seasons are the same uh, beginning May 1 uh, in both areas. And so in our final version at the last minute, we moved um, things around hoping to make it more clear for uh, the reader. And um, I think Darius was just working off of the final draft. So um, not a big deal. Um, just to clarify, the Cape Falcon to Hecate line um, fishery opens uh, May 20 to April 30 um, for that specific area. And then from the whole area, Cape Falcon to Humbug um, beginning May 31, as described on that uh, page four is is correct so uh, that's i just wanted to clarify that for those listening in yeah thank you robin um and with that uh, questions for the uh, sas uh susan bishop susan 
Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Can you hear me okay? Uh, I can. Okay. I think this may be a just a, clar a clarifying question for Mr. Johnson. So looking at table one, uh, the bottom of page two and the top of page three for the commercial troll fisheries. Um, I noticed that uh, when it refers to on page, on page two in 2021, vessels may not land fish. I was just clarifying whether that was specific to salmon or any fish at all. Similar kind of question uh, just below that in 2022, vessels may not land fish. Um, uh, and then on page, uh, sorry, the top of page three, uh, it uh, refers to fishing, vessels fishing in or in possession of salmon north of Leadbetter Point may, must land and deliver all species of fish. Just clarifying that whether that meant salmon or whether we're talking uh, more broadly. Um, it's just important to make sure that we're tracking the what's intended for our regula regulations as we go forward. Thank you, Susan. Okay, um, questions for the SAS? All right. Oh, Kyle Addix, Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, first, just acknowledge Ms. Bishop's question, and we'll look into that and and make sure we we know what that language what language needs to be there, and that we have it correct. I did have a couple of questions for the Washington SAS members. Um, the first is there is a trade reference of 3,200 Mark Coho for 800 Chinook in the North of Falcon Fishery. I just wanted to confirm that that trade. Um, was recommended and supported by the recreational and commercial members of the SAS. Thank you, Kyle. This is Ryan. Yes, that supported by the commercial side. And I think Dave spoke to it um, when he read that Rex supported too, but I'll let him answer. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I, I believe I did hear the other Mr. Johnson confirmed that during his um, reading of the document. So thanks for that. If I may, my second question was, it appears that the allocation among the ports north of Falcon of the Coho TAC is different from what's specified in the FMP. So I just wanted to confirm that that deviation from the FMP port allocation was supported by the representatives of the ports north of Falcon. Is that a question for uh, the Washington reps, Oregon, or both, the Kyle? Um, probably for um, Mr. Johnson would be the best to answer that. Okay. Mr. Dave Johnson. Yeah. Dave? Dave, are you still there? Can you hear me, sir? I, I can. Okay. Thank you for the question, Mr. Vice Chair. And Mr. Addix, yes, we agreed all through the ports one through four um, in a total agreement of the quota change and also again on the trade with the troll fishery. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Uh, further questions for the SAS? Okay, seeing none, um, we have two public comment cards. Um, and uh, we did have three, but that person uh, had to uh, drop off because of the time constraint. But he did uh, put uh, testimony in comments section. We would ask people not to do that. Um, anyway, so with that, we will go to, um, we'll finish up here for this uh, agenda here before lunch. We'll go to uh, Doug Laughlin, followed by uh, John Lee. Doug, Doug, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, just a couple quick, th quick things. Uh, I wanted to um, uh, mention the MREP support that um, and involvement that the council uh, has, and uh, I do appreciate it. It launched me on my um, abilities to join uh, this process and feel uh, better educated and better informed to to you know to uh, um, to help out. Um, and in helping out, my second point was the hospitality shown by the council and 
the SAS and the California group in the SAS and the California delegation. I feel very welcomed and um, a part of this process. Uh, quickly on the salmon, um, uh, from my point of view with the Coastside Fishing Club and my own uh, view, uh, we would like as much opportunity on the water as possible. Alternate ones is, is what our membership uh, was looking at and enjoys uh, not knowing that there are, you know, possibly some further adjustments. So any adjustments that might increase our opportunity on the water uh, would be greatly appreciated. And uh, that's pretty much all I have to say at this point. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Doug. Uh, questions for Doug? Okay. Uh, seeing none, I will go to John Lee. John, are you there? Okay, I'm not seeing John. And actually, I just uh, text from Chuck. This was an afternoon uh, agenda item. Um, maybe Chuck, maybe I should ask you, should we uh, potentially, um, should we finish this after lunch or conclude it here? We're, we're well, ahead, well, well ahead of schedule. Hey, Ryan, this is Darius Peak. Um, I'm still working on a um, yeah, so, uh, online. Um, yes. uh, oh, there you go. Go ahead, Chuck. Chuck, are you there? He is unmuted, but I don't hear him. Huh. Okay, I'm having a, can you hear me now? We can. Okay. <clears throat> I'm having soundboard problems again on my main machine, so I'm on my backup. Uh, so <clears throat> we've, uh, we are well ahead of schedule here on this agenda item. Uh, I, I guess I would suggest perhaps we should take a lunch break now, come back and uh, perhaps give Mr. Lee another chance to uh, provide his public testimony and conclude action then. But uh, so that that's one option. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if I'm not sure how much guidance the council's uh, going to be giving given on this, but uh, you know, uh, I, I guess that's my suggestion. That the other option would be just to, you know finish it all off and adjourn for the day, um, or I guess we could always look at other, uh, other options. I don't know if we've got anything that we could uh, move up, you know, this early in the council meeting that would uh, save us a whole lot of time. But um, so uh, I think those are our options. Okay. Thanks, Chuck. Well, well, how about maybe we go to a, um, let's what we adjourn for now, finish up after the break. Um, let's have a, let me a long lunch so we can maybe uh, get some things figured out if we want to move something up. A little more time to think about that. Um, it may come back at 1.30. Does that sound? Uh, how's that sound? Sounds good. Okay. Okay. Uh, we'll adjourn to 1.30 and uh, we'll see everybody back here uh, then. Thank you.
everyone to take their seats. So we'll get started here uh, momentarily. Okay, everyone, uh, we're back on the D1. Um, before we start up here, I'm going to uh, turn to our executive director, uh, Chuck, for uh, maybe some agenda changes here. Chuck? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Yeah, so we've uh, been talking over the lunch break about the uh, possibility of um, moving some things up, <clears throat> and uh, we've, we've got some things that uh, we'd like to do. Um, we'd like to move up... Um, D2, which is a salmon methodology review. Um, so we'd like to move that up since we're seem to be uh, well ahead of schedule here. Uh, we can't get to that till after two o'clock. One of the uh, principals there has a conflict, but uh, but we should be able to do that. Um, we are also we think we can move up uh, halibut incidental landing limits in the salmon troll fishery. That's G1. So we think we can uh, get that done as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, believe it or not, <laughs> there's been some uh, very recently breaking news on uh, C1, the habitat issues uh, in regards to the uh, uh, solicitor's opinions that uh, were the subject of this morning's discussion. And in fact, the Secretary of Interior has rescinded those very um, uh, solicitor's opinions and, and a number of other uh, actions associated with Klamath water management. So, uh, so I think we might be able to uh, uh, take another quick look at that and see if there's uh, see if we have any uh, business yet to do uh, on that, um, rather than um, waiting until the end of the week for for that. So, uh, so those are the three things I think we would like to uh, address this afternoon after we complete this agenda item. Uh, so we are on D1, the tentative adoption of 21 salmon management measures. Uh, we are <clears throat> into uh, public comment. There were there were three signups, but uh, but um, uh, two of the people uh, are do not appear to be available. So I will uh, maybe just ask um, if John Lay or uh, or uh, uh, Jeff. Um, I should forget your name, Jeff. Uh, are <clears throat> Are available for um, uh, for their public comments at this time. Um, Jeff Richards, uh, I, don't, I don't see you on the attendees list. So, uh, but if you are there, if you could make make yourself known that you would like to present your uh, public testimony, uh, we would be happy to hear it. Um, if not, then I suggest we uh, proceed with. Council action on this agenda item. <clears throat> um, uh, so uh, I will uh, turn it back to you, Mr. Vice Chair, and see if uh, there's any discussion about uh, proposals to move ahead this afternoon. Very good. Thank you, Chuck. And, uh, and with that, I'll turn to the council and uh, Brent Cormos. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Just one quick question. Uh, Hearing that methodology review will commence at two, and this may be done before then, is it safe to say that halibut and habitat will come after salmon? Uh, no, I don't think I don't think it's safe to say that. I mean, if this goes, you know, if this is a five minute, uh, this is five minutes, and I think we could move on to uh, probably habitat first, um, and then. Uh, pick up uh, halibut and then do salmon methodology review it too. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Brett, for that uh, clarification. Um, well, seeing we have no uh, 
we're out of public uh, comment and to council action. <clears throat> Looking for hands. Aha, Kyle, call Alex. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I do have a motion ready for the council if it's the appropriate time. I didn't know if we wanted to have any council discussion before getting there. Um, I also see Mr. Anderson has his hand up, so maybe I'll just be on standby with a motion. There we go. Uh, thank you, Kyle. Uh, Phil, Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I was just uh, <clears throat> refreshing my memory with the Salmon Framework Management plan as it as it relates to deviating from the um, sub quotas for the ports in the area north of Falcon on Coho. Um, and and I know there had been some discussion in March about the potential need to do a, an emergency rule to accomplish that along with there were some other um, features, I believe, of, of alternative two that <clears throat> there were some deliberations around uh, whether or not an emergency rule was required or not. And I am aware that there's been some um, dialogue between National Marine Fisheries Service, um, in particular, Susan Bishop and, and Kyle Addix as it relates to the um, alternatives and the need for an emergency rule. And, and after I uh, refresh my memory with what is in the um, framework plan and the flexibility that's provided, um, assuming that there's uh, concurrence among the representatives of the ports, um, that that can be done preseason without an emergency rule. And I also was looking at the, the trade arrangement <clears throat> that's in the alternatives uh, North Falcon that was presented by the by the SAS and and similarly see that we do have the flexibility within the framework plan to do that. Uh, those were my, those were my conclusions at least after I read it and refreshed my memory and looked at what is in uh, what was proposed by the SAS and I just wondered if and I know Kyle spoke to this a little bit and ask questions about whether there was concurrence and among the, the port representatives on the rec side as well as between the recreational and commercial SAS members. And I just wanted to get confirmation, um, if that's possible, from National Marine Fisheries Service that they, based on the discussion that occurred between March and, and April, a reading of the framework management plan and the acknowledgement that we received from the port representatives and the representatives from the commercial and sport sectors that we are not in a position where we need an emergency rule to move forward with the alternative that was presented uh, by the SAS for the fisheries north of Falcon. Okay, thank you, Chuck. And uh, Susan Bishop, Susan? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Um, you are correct in that we had identified three issues that may have led us um, to require an emergency rule. We have managed to resolve two of those issues. I will still need to touch bases with uh, the state of Washington with regard to whether the, the recent uh, proposal for the trade would resolve the, out, the remaining um, uh, concern, which had to do with the proportion uh, sharing between the commercial and the recreational sectors. So it is on my radar, and I have reached out to Mr. Addix to discuss with him. Thank you, Susan. Okay. Any further discussion on that or uh, any other matters or, um, for council action here before we go to, uh, to Washington? Hopefully Kyle will put his hand back up. Aha, <laughs> Kyle Alex. Kyle? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I do have a motion that Sandra should have.
I move to tentatively adopt the ocean salmon fishery management measures for non-Indian fisheries as presented in agenda item D1E, Supplemental SAS Report 1, dated April 8, 2021, for SDT collation and analysis. Thank you, Kyle. Does the language on the screen uh, re actually reflect uh, your motion? It does. Very good. Um, speak to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And this motion is is for the entire coast, Need but I'll speak. Second. Oh, yeah, sorry, Phil. Well, you need a second, yeah, um, I, which I'm, it, I am it, it, offering. It's early in the afternoon. <laughs> um, we're doing so well today, too. Um, with that, thank you, Phil, for your second. And uh, Kyle, um, <laughs> Please speak thank, to your question. thank you again, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, this motion is actually for the entire coast. I'll just speak to the north of Falcon portion, and we can see if my colleagues to the south have anything they'd like to add. Um, as you heard in the discussion just a minute ago, when we left March, we believed alternative two would require emergency action to implement um, with some discussions in the interim. This is not the same. Um, package that was in alternative to alternative two included just a sort of direct allocation into the recreational fisher in the fishery in the Columbia River area. This uh, package involves a trade instead of just a direct injection of fish into that allocation. So it is a trade that was agreed to by the sectors and then a reallocation among the sport um, ports that was agreed to by those ports. So I don't believe this would require implementation by emergency rule. I don't believe it deviates from the FMP. It does result in the same allocation outcomes that alternative two did. Um, so all of the ranges are within what was out for public review. Um, wanted to thank the Columbia River tribes and the Quinault Nation and Mr. Oatman for delivering the Quinault testimony this morning. As always, we've had a, a month of working through issues with all our co-managers and the, the spotlight this year has really been on coastal coho in Washington and working with the Quinault Nation on the Queets River where we have a forecast that's below our escapement floor on trying to find a balance of harvest and escapement that makes sense given the combination of forecasts we have this year. So we'll be continuing that work with Quinault and the Queets and with all of our other co-managers in the watersheds around Washington over the coming week um, to try to get to an ocean package and matching inside packages that meet all of our conservation objectives when we conclude um, next week. Um, thanks to the SAS, the STT, and everybody else who's gotten us this far. I think this is a good package to get us down the home stretch here and um, look forward to working on, working on it with everyone over the next week. Thank you for that, Kyle. Um, discussion, questions for Kyle? Okay, um, seeing none, I'll call for the question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Okay, motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Kyle. All right. So I guess um, moving, down the, moving down the coast, um, Chris, are you, you have something for us? Uh, no, Mr. Vice Chair, I think uh, the motion covered. Oh, the, I'm sorry. I don't have anything to add. Okay. Thank okay. you. I'm sorry. Um, I said Joe Oatman. Uh, Joe? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. <laughs> I, I do have a motion uh, for the council. I think uh, Sandra has that. Um, do you want to, to note that uh, what's being presented here is uh, identical to what has already been in place? Um, so I move to council adopt for STT analysis the following initial treaty troll seven management measures. Uh, first being uh, Macaw Tribe, alternative one, 50,000 Chinook and 50,000 Coho, alternative two. 35,000 Chinook and 35,000 Coho. Alternative three, zero Chinook and zero Coho. For the QTA tribes, alternative one, 35,000 Chinook and 16,500 Coho. 
Alternative 2, 25,000 Chinook and 10,000 Coho. Alternative 3, 0 Chinook and 0 Coho. The alternatives consist of a May 1 to June 30 Chinook directed fishery and a July 1 to September 15 all species fishery. The Chinook quota should be evenly split between the two time periods. Thank you, Joe. Does the uh, language on the screen accurately reflect your motion? It does, Mr. Vice Chair. Okay, looking for a second. Seconded by Kyle Addix. Thank you, Kyle. Um, Joe, you can speak to your motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, not going to provide uh, much comment on this. Uh, these uh, alternatives across the Macaw and QTA are uh, the same from uh, what was considered uh, back in the March meeting. Uh, one of the uh, purposes of this motion is to um, allow some additional time for the uh, tribes to um, meet and work on uh, these alternatives. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Very good. Thank you. Um, Krista Swenson, uh, good discussion here. Krista? Sorry there, double mute. I was a backup second, so I'll lower my hand if it's still raised. You're fine. We heard you, but not now. She, she was just saying that she had raised her hand to second the motion, but it's already been seconded, so she has nothing to say at this point. I think Butcher, she says. Or, or Butcher, were you a second also? No, I, I had some uh, discussion, but but I can I can wait till the seconds are done. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chair. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, uh, Councilman Oldman, I, I obviously support your your option. I, um, but I, I, we did hear some uh, testimony from the Confederated Tribes of the Columbia River today and, 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 and Wilbur on, on, some, on some concerns. Um, and I was wondering if uh, the SDT and could talk about um, one of those concerns um, why we were um, doing the analysis on potentially mismarking or mis uh, mismarking of a area where the fish were caught uh, potentially in between buoy 10 in the ocean and and maybe the SDT through uh, Chairman O'Farrell could uh, could come back um, uh, as you know a, a, few, a few tags uh showing up in in odd places can really skew the uh future you know modeling and stuff one way or the other so i would just like to add this just to just to uh, see if we could uh you know maybe uh when mr o'farrell gets to talk maybe he can talk to that a little bit um see if they could look at that uh during the week that's all mr chairman thank you yeah thank you much so you're wanting to uh um, that, was that question for him to talk, uh, speak to us now or, or address that later in the... In the speak to us now. It was just recognizing uh, Wilbur's concerns. Um, okay. And uh, and I, and when, when, you know, I miss all you guys in this process sitting down talk, I, I do miss Wilbur uh, yelling at me first and then having nice long talks in the hallway. So I, I just thought it would be a good placeholder for, for this to be looked at also why, why we were doing the analysis. Very good. Um, Mike, are you available? Uh, yes, Mr. Vice Chair, I'm here. Yeah, so you heard Butch's question. Um, your thoughts? Yes, um, I, I did hear uh, Butch's question, question, and um, I'd be happy to bring this up with the STT. Um, we can, the team can have a discussion about this issue and potential ramifications of it in the future and uh, we'll report back to the council um, on what we find. Okay, very good. So, okay, thank you. Um, further questions, discussion on the motion? Okay, 
Seeing none, um, I'll call for the question. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Abstentions? Motion passed unanimously. Okay. Very good. I will turn to Robin, I think, and say, Robin, how are we doing here? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I think that went uh, pretty smoothly, actually. So it was a, a pretty involved agenda item. Uh, you heard from the STT, which gave you the update of the changes that occurred since we last met in March. You heard from the states of Oregon, Washington, and California about the public hearings that were held and the comments that were received. You've heard um, from Phil Anderson and Danny Evanson on the uh, PSC uh, meetings and what the CTC memo included and entailed. You also heard tribal statements from the Quinault Indian Tribe and the Columbia River Tribes. The SAS did provide uh, for consideration uh, for first round options. And uh, we had a motion from the uh, tribal governments for their seasons. And we also received a motion for the non-tribal uh, seasons that were contained in uh, the SAS report D1. And so with that, then the STT uh, will take that information and run their analysis and return uh, tomorrow uh, with the results. So with that, I think you have concluded all your work under this agenda item. Uh, very well done. Okay, thank you, Robin, for the uh, summary. And uh, well done, everyone. Um, I believe now, I believe we're going to go to, go to, go to C1. Is it that my instructions from uh, Chuck, I believe? Um, and I, uh, Chuck, you want to lay out the rest of the afternoon here for us? So everybody's clear about what we're doing? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I don't know how how clear I can be, but uh, so um, again, we had three items that we were hoping we could move up. Uh, C1 because of the recent developments. Um, G1, which is the um, halibut incidental landing restrictions. Uh, we don't have that report in the briefing book yet, the, uh, the SAS recommendations on that. So we're not quite ready for that. And then uh, D1, uh, which we knew had to at least wait until two o'clock. It looks like there's some additional uh, statements coming in on that as well. Uh, I don't believe those are, um, uh, are in yet either. So I think, uh, I think our best bet is to start with C1 and see what's available after that. Uh, we, it may be necessary to take another bit of a break and, and uh, to see if we can come back and, and do some other business later in the afternoon if some of those reports are still, uh, still flowing in. Okay, very good. Um, well, with that, I will turn the gavel back to uh, Chair Grolnick and uh, he'll probably start us off on C1 next. So, um, Mark? All right, thanks very much, uh, Brad. Uh, so uh, we left uh, agenda item C1 open, uh, actually contemplating um, a draft letter, but um, events have overtaken that. Um, as uh, Chuck mentioned, uh, today the uh, Secretary of the Interior issued a memo withdrawing, um, apparently withdrawing the very um, documents uh, that we, the Habitat Committee had wanted the council to seek uh, to have rescinded. So it's not clear at this point that the, uh, a letter is necessary uh, or appropriate, but um, let's see if there's any uh, discussion or dissent on that. And then uh, if the council does choose to, set, to change its mind on sending a letter, we would need a motion to uh, uh, to rescind or to amend the uh, the motion we previously passed. So let me see if there are any um, hands up. Uh, Pete Hassamer. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Just for clarity, the what was rescinded was both the opinions and the guidance document. The sorry if you stated that. I just looking through our various materials, but um, 
everything was rescinded that the uh, Habitat Committee had addressed? That is my understanding. The memorandum from the secretary will be added as an informational report. Um, and it, it certainly did withdraw the uh, various communications from the solicitor on the Klamath. Let me see if I can go to the memorandum. It's, it, will, it will be in the briefing book shortly. It just came out today. Um, the, uh, unfortunately, the, um, the uh, Habitat Committee's report did not refer to the legal memorandum by specific name, whereas this mem mem memorandum does. Um, but it, the titles of the, of the memos clearly refer to flows uh, on the Klamath and the Endangered Species Act. And uh, and a letter from David Bernhardt dated January 16th that does seem to jibe with the reference in the Habitat Committee uh, uh, report. Oh, I was muted. Um, I don't see Lance in attendance here. Uh, so I don't think we have anyone here from the Habitat Committee to confirm that uh, this memorandum from the Secretary of the Interior covers those memos. But based on my review of the titles, they certainly it certainly does appear to apply. Unfortunately, we can't delegate to the Habitat Committee to confirm this since I believe their business is done for the meeting. Uh, Mr. Chair, I guess if it pleases the council, it could be, uh, we could read it in if people would, would so desire. It'll be a little bit before it gets actually posted. It's uh, about two, just a little less than two pages. I'm not seeing any appetite from the council right now to address C1. At least I'm not seeing any hands. Um, Pete Hassemer. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I believe it, it would be good to read it in if it clarifies the question we have. Um, in our, our letter was uh, intended to address both the solicitor's opinions and the guidance document we had that discussion and if we get a, a solid indication that all of that has been withdrawn or rescinded then i think it would be appropriate to have the habitat committee stand down but um so we either you know, wait i guess i prefer we just have chuck read it that might be the quickest way to get through this all right. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Okay. So uh, a couple of preliminary paragraphs on January 20th, President Biden signed Executive Order 13990 entitled Protecting Public Health and the Environment and Restoring Science to Tackle the Climate Crisis. 
that affirms the new administration's commitment to organize and deploy the full capacity of its agencies to combat the climate crisis, increasing resilience to the impacts of climate change, protecting public health, conserving our lands, waters, biodiversity, and delivering environmental justice. Among other things, the EO directs agency, agencies to immediately review and it's appropriate and consistent with applicable law to take action to address certain regulations or other agency actions that conflict with the national objectives set forth in the EO. Biden-Harris administration has also made it made clear its commitment to respect tribal sovereignty and self-governance and fulfill tr federal trust and treaty responsibilities to tribal nations through regular, meaningful, and robust consultations. Klamath Basin in Southern Oregon and Northern California is facing one of the most, one of the worst drought years in four decades. Water flowing from the Upper Klamath Lake and the Klamath River is critically important to communities in the region, including farmers, ranchers, commercial fishermen, and multiple tribes in the Klamath Basin that depend on the waters, fisheries, and other natural resources for their livelihoods. Given the dire, unprecedented drought conditions that we are facing, we know that the difficult decisions will be made in the coming days and weeks to address water shortages. Through this memorandum, I am directing each of you to work collaboratively across our agency and across the federal government and with our state, local, tribal, and community partners to identify steps that can be taken to minimize the impact of upcoming water allocation decisions and develop a long-term plan to facilitate the conservation and economic growth in the Klamath Basin. And then more substantively, uh, consistent with these principles, I hereby withdraw the following memoranda, letters, and analyses related to the Bureau of Reclamation's Klamath Project issued during the previous administration. August 19th, 2020, memorandum to file regarding reclamation decision on Yurok tribe's request for boat dance flows. To the extent it may have pres uh, precedential effects on future operations. <clears throat> October 28th, 2020, memorandum from Carter L. Brown, Associate Solicitor, Division of Water Resources in Lancey, Winger Regional Solicitor, Pacific Southwest, to Daniel H. Orhani, Solicitor regarding an updated review of legal issues concerning the United States Bureau of Reclamation Operation of the Klamath Project. Solicitor Orhani suggested, uh, signed, and concurred on October 29, 2020. Next, uh, November 12, 2020, letters from David Bernhardt to Paul Simmons, Klamath Water Users Association, and Nathan Reitman, Reitman Law PC, respectively, regarding Klamath Project Water Contracts and the Endangered Species Act. In January 2021, reassessment of U.S. Bureau of Reclamation Klamath Project operations to facilitate compliance with Section 7A2 of the Endangered Species Act. And on January 14th, 2021, memorandum from solicitor to secretary regarding analysis of Klamath project contracts to determine discretionary authority in accordance with the November 12th, 2020 letter of the Secretary of the Interior. In January, also January 14th, 2021, memorandum from the solicitor to the secretary regarding use of water previously stored in priority for satisfaction of downstream rights and finally, January 16th, 2021, letters from David Bernhardt to Paul Simmons, Klamath Water Users Association, and Nathan Reitman, Reitman Law PC, respectively, regarding completion of analysis based on November, 20, November 12th, 2020 letter, enclosing January 14th, 2021 memoranda and January 21 reassessment. These documents are issued without government-to-government -government consultation with affected tribes and do not reflect the current administration's goals for long-term water recovery and economic restoration in the region. The document documents also conflict with long-standing departmental positions and interpretation of governing law and should not be relied upon for any purpose. My directive is made under the authority of Section 2 of Reorganization Plan 3 of 1950-64 stat 1262, 209 DM 3.2, and other applicable authorities. Next, it's the end of the letter. Thank you, Chuck. I don't know if that helped or not. But. 
there, you know, there does seem to be some alignment with the documents the Habitat Committee referenced. So what is the pleasure of the council? The council prepared to make to make a change here or wants to wait? Uh, Marcy Remco. Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this announcement is certainly timely. <laughs> um, I, I believe that uh, this memo confirms that um, the secretary has withdrawn uh, the solicitor general's opinions that were of concern um, of the Habitat Committee, uh, as well as the guidance document that resulted from those opinions. So um, I believe that the immediate need uh, for the council to provide comment on um, EFH and uh, how important EFH is in ongoing considerations regarding the Klamath um, now is probably not the time um, given this new development. I think uh, the urgency that we heard about earlier this morning has passed. And um, while I um, hold open the question as to whether uh, or not um, at some point um, in the future, whether that future be near future or more distant future, uh, that a comment letter from us uh, may be appropriate. I, I, I think we can discuss that um, at a later time, recognizing that the Habitat Committee has uh, already adjourned for the April meeting. Um, so I think that the need um, right now for us to uh, task them um, with crafting a letter has passed and um, I am comfortable with us uh, rescinding the motion that we made earlier today. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, before you uh, offer a motion, let me see if there are any other hands. Uh, so I don't see any other hands. So uh, if you have a motion, uh, please make it and then we can have any further discussion. Mercy. Sure, I'll, I'll give this a go, Sandra. <laughs> I move. We rescind the motion made under agenda item C1. That language is complete and accurate. Sounds good to me. All right, I'm looking for a second uh, and I assume Pete Hasmer has his hand raised for the second. And if I was, okay, I guess I'd assume correctly. Uh, Ari, please speak to your motion as necessary. I think we've covered it, thank you. All right, is there any discussion on the motion? Pete Hasmer. Uh Sorry, Mr. Chair, I, I support this motion. There's a delay between clicking lowering the hand and it actually going down. Okay. All right, I understand. I have that problem sometimes. So are there any other uh, discussion on this motion? And it being a motion to rescind without notice, I think uh, our parliamentarian would confirm that we need at least a two thirds vote, but we'll see what we end up with. Uh, any discussion? Not seeing any, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. And any abstentions? All right, so the motion passes unanimously, therefore obviously clearing our two thirds threshold. And uh, we have now rescinded that in view of developments. I'm 
very glad that that action was taken today and not after our meeting. So is there any further business on C1? Okay, uh, I'm not uh, seeing any. So that will conclude uh, our revisiting of C1 and conclude that agenda item for the meeting. And I understand we are next going to go to agenda item G1. Um, if I do, I have that correctly. Yes. Okay. And I think that Brad, I think you have the um, the gavel for that. So I will pass the gavel to you. Very good. Thank you, uh, Chair Grelnick. And I'll look to uh, Robin uh, Elke to get us started here. Robin. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, this is agenda item G1, the incidental catch limits for the 2021 salmon troll fishery, the final action. The 2021 Pacific Halibut Catch Sharing Plan for Area 2A allocates 15% of the non-Indian commercial halibut allocation to the salmon troll fishery as incidental catch. The primary management objective outlined in the catch sharing plan is to attain the incidental quota during the April through June salmon troll fishery with a secondary objective to attain the balance of the quota from July to the end of the salmon troll season. The council has successfully used landing ratios and a total trip limit to ensure manageable progression of the fishery in past years. And a summary of that management information is provided in attachment one. The current landing restrictions, which would continue through May 15, are no more than one halibut per two Chinook, except one halibut may be landed without meeting the ratio requirement, and no more than 35 halibut may be landed per trip. At the March meeting, the council adopted the, for public review the following three options for incidental halibut retention in the 2021 salmon troll fishery beginning May 16. Option one would be status quo. So again, the license holders may land no more than one halibut per two Chinook, except for one Pacific halibut may be landed without meeting the ratio requirement and no more than 35 halibut landed per trip. Option two is the same as option one, except no more than 30 halibut may be landed per trip. And option three, same as option one, except for no more than 25 halibut may be landed per trip. The landing restrictions adopted for the start of the salmon season beginning May 16, 2021 will also be in effect from April through May 15 of 2022, unless modified through in-season action or until superseded by the 2022 management measures. So your council action for today is to adopt final landing restrictions for Pacific halibut caught incidentally in the non-Indian salmon troll fishery May 16, 2021 through the end of 2021 salmon troll season and prior to the effective date of 2022 management measures unless modified through in-season action. And again, uh, for your reference material, we do have attachment one, which has a nice table showing what the land landing limits and allocation has been since at least 1995. Uh, we also have a supplemental SAS report uh, under G1 and um, public comment, um, if there were any, would be available to you as well. So that would conclude my summary. Thank you, Robin. Uh, questions for Robin before we get started? Okay. Seeing none, um, and I see on my list at least um, the SAS report is the only one we have. Um, and uh, look to uh, Ryan Johnson. Ryan? Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, Council. I'm re I'll read the Salmon Advisory Report on Incidental Halibut Catch Limits for 2021 through 22 salmon troll. The SAS recommends the following catch limits for final adoption. Option one, open May 16, 2021 through the end of the 2021 salmon troll season um, and beginning April 1st, 2022 until modified through in-season action or superseded by the 2022 management measures. 
License holders may land no more than one Pacific halibut per two Chinook, except one Pacific halibut may be landed without meeting the ratio requirement. No more than 35 halibut landed per trip. That concludes the report. Thank you, Ryan. Questions for the SAS? Okay, thanks, Ryan. Um, with that, I don't see any advisory bodies. Um, no public comment, which would take us to uh, council action. And with that, um, always looking for a hand. I see a Chris Kern. Chris. Sure. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I'll I'll take a shot at a motion if it's your pleasure. Please. Okay, I would move the council adopt final landing restrictions for Pacific halibut uh, caught incidentally in the non-Indian salmon troll fishery as reflected in agenda item G1A supplemental SAS report uh, dated April 2021. Thank you, Chris. Does the uh, screen, uh, language on the screen accurately reflect your motion? After she gets done typing it, of course. Yeah. And Sandra, did you did you catch the um, uh, incidentally caught caught incidentally in the non-Indian salmon troll fishery? Perfect. Okay, very good. Second. Heather Hall, thank you, Heather. Uh, speak to your motion, uh, Chris. Uh, very briefly, um, I know the SAS has been working on this. Sounds like they've come to agreement on this and it meets all of our uh, conservation needs and our uh, other guidance. So um, ready to move it forward. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, further discussion on the motion? Okay, seeing none, we'll call for the vote. All those in favor, uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, abstentions? Very good. Motion passes unanimously. Moving right through it here. Um, Robin, I turn to you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. You made easy work of this agenda item. The council has adopted option one, uh, consistent with the SAS uh, recommendation. And with that, uh, you have done your work under this agenda item G1. Okay, very good, very good. And um, I believe we are ready for uh, D2. Um, so I would, uh, with no further further ado, I'd ask you to uh, to um, take all take us uh, take us into it, please. Thank you again, Mr. Vice Chair. Agenda item D two. This is the methodology review preliminary topic selection. Each year, the Scientific and Statistical Committee completes a methodology review to help assure new or significantly modified methodologies employed to estimate impacts of the Pacific Fishery Management Council's salmon management use the best available science. The process normally involves first developing a list of potential topics for review in April, at the April Council meeting, second development of analytical materials to be reviewed between April and September Council's meeting, final selection for review topics at the September Council meeting, review of selected topics in October by the SSC Salmon Subcommittee and the Salmon Technical Team, and finally, number three, review by the full SSC at the November Council meeting. This review process is in preparation for the November Council meeting and the Council adoption of all proposed changes to be implemented in the coming season or in certain limited cases providing directions for handling any unresolved methodology problems prior to the formulation of the salmon management options in March. Because there's insufficient time to review new or modified measures at the March meeting, the council may reject their use if they have not been approved the preceding November. 
The SAS will receive input from the STT and the Model Evaluation Work Group and provide recommendations for methodologies to be reviewed in 2021. So your council action under this agenda item would be to provide guidance to the SSC regarding potential topics and priorities for methodologies to, re, to be reviewed in 2021. And secondly, to request what relevant agencies develop and provide needed materials to the SSC as appropriate. And for your reference materials under this agenda item, we have um, a report from the model evaluation work group from the salmon technical team from the scientific and statistical committee and also a tribal report which is a joint testimony from the western washington treaty tribes and then of course any public comment as it may come in so with that that concludes my summary of agenda item d2 thank you robin uh questions uh, for robin before we uh, move to the reports Okay. Um, okay, we'll go to the uh, SAMA technical team and uh, Dr. O'Farrell. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I will be referring to agenda item D2A, Supplemental STT Report 1 on uh, methodology review preliminary topic selection. Uh, the SAMA technical team met with the SSC and the model evaluation evaluation work group to discuss potential topics for methodology review in 2021. Following these discussions, the STT identified four topics as candidates for review by the STT and the SAMIN subcommittee of the SSC in October 20. Should, should be October 2021 there, it says October 2020, with lead, the lead entity in parentheses and potential contributing agencies in brackets. Number one, provide documentation of the abundance forecast approach for Willapa Bay Natural Coho, um, STT, but with contributions uh, from WDFW. Number two, revision of the Sacramento River Fall Chinook Conservation Objective, again, STT, but a number of other agencies identified as uh, pertinent to this effort, including California Department of Fish and Wildlife, ODFW, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, National Marine Fisheries Service, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Number three, documentation of the fishery regulation assessment model program and development of the new Chinook Fram base period, including algorithms. A responsible um, entity would be the MU. Number four, evaluate postseason metrics of Fram model performance. Again, uh, this would be a MU uh, uh, topic. The STT considered including an evaluation of the Oregon Production Index Hatchery Coho Forecast on the list of potential methodology review topics to discuss this with the MU and SSC. After further discussion, the STT decided not to include this topic on the list for methodology review in 2021 because the OPIH Abundance Forecast Model is documented in Preseason Report 1 and there has been no change in methodology proposed. That concludes the STT statement. Thank you, Mike. Uh, questions for Mike and the team? Okay. Thanks, Mike. Um, next up, we'll, uh, we'll be new with uh, Angelica uh, hagen -Bro. Correct me if, I'm, uh, if I mangle that, Angelica. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, Mr. Chair, members of the council, good afternoon. I'm providing comment for agenda item D2A. The model evaluation work group or MU met on Tuesday, April 6 to discuss possible methodology review topics for 2021 and reviewed potential topics with the salmon technical team in a joint discussion. In addition, the chair of the MU attended the scientific and statistical committee discussion with the STT on Wednesday, April 7. The methodology re review process was foregone last year to the, due to the prioritization of essential items for the April 2020 Council agenda as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. The list of potential re review topics provided here are carryovers from 2019 with responsible parties shown in parentheses. The MU also provides comments and suggestions 
on how to approach review of these topics. Number one, documentation of the fishery regulation assessment model frame program and the development of the new Chinook frame base period, including algorithms and user manual, new as a responsible party. 1A, the MU suggests prioritizing components of the FRAM documentation so that attainable goals can be set. Each component has its own nuances and level of complexity. The MU identified six main areas for FRAM documentation and has prioritized them in order. Item two appears to be a reasonable candidate for completion in 2021. Um, number one uh, was the user manual, which is completed and ready to be uploaded to the council website. Uh, item uh, two is the overview. This is the item we identified as a candidate for completion in 2021. Then uh, less priority technical detail is three, the Chinook base period four, Coho base period five, and the programmer's guide six. So the second potential re review topic is the evaluation of postseason metrics of FRAM model performance with the MU as the lead. Um, the first uh, kind of evaluation would be a FRAM to FRAM evaluation. And as mentioned in 2019, the new FRAM based period was used for the first time in 2017. So evaluating FRAM performance in a pre versus postseason context We'll need to wait until at least 2022 20, postseason data are available. Um, the MU, however, thinks that a frame comparison to an outside model is doable and sees potential value in evaluating frame performance through a comparison of exploitation rates derived using the Chinook Technical Committee's exploitation rate analysis with those derived using the most current version of frame postseason output. The MU also discussed the recent interest in the Oregon Production Index forecast. The forecast has not performed well in recent years, and this year's forecast is very high. The MU acknowledged that the OPI technical team produces the forecast in a collaborative process, and the preseason one report provides documentation of the forecast methodology. Additionally, the MU discussed the possibility of organizing a frame workshop. This workshop would be designed to provide members of the SSC, STT, and MU with a detailed understanding of FRAM in order to facilitate the model evaluation process. The MU introduced this concept in 2019 and interest remains. Such a workshop could be held in conjunction with the annual SSC, STT methodology re review meeting, typically held in October. The MU also noted that there are currently three vacancies on the work group, one Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission, one Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission, and one from the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. The MU would like to see those vacancies filled. This would have the benefit of an expanded range of knowledge and expertise within the work group and help share the workload for any future tasks. That completes uh, my item. Thank you. Um, questions for the MU? Uh -huh. uh, Chris Kern. Chris? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, these are quick and, well, hopefully quick. If they're too detailed, I can get them offline. Um, the, uh, just two quick questions. Um, and it may just be that I don't recall um, the background on it, so I'll try and be brief. The uh, Muse comment on number two relative to the time frame that needs to be uh, in the books before the postseason assessment can occur um, says 2022 is can you is it possible to briefly describe what what the uh, what drove that as the target it looks like it's a six calendar year period so maybe it's a cohort thing um, I don't know whether there was a, a detailed scientific assessment as to how many years, but uh, um, I guess uh, 2022, uh, if we're doing um, preseason assessments, uh, that would mean that we probably only have, um, well, six years to work with. And that, that seems to be uh, a short enough a time series that shorten shortening it anymore would probably not be very meaningful. Thanks. Mr. Uh, Vice Chair, can I just follow up real quick? Please. 
Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you, uh, Gelka. I wasn't um, intending to question the time frame either. I'm just curious. Um, and then the um, the potential for a Fram workshop does sound like an excellent idea to me. I know a number of folks uh, could use some some more information um, structured in a in a you know more complete way than uh, coming and asking questions periodically. And frankly, I might be be interested in attending as well. So I appreciate that. Thanks. That's all I had. That's encouraging. Thank you. Uh, Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, Ms. Hoggenbro, I know number one, the FRAM documentation is sort of a perennial issue on the list. Um, so first, Great news that the user manual is complete and ready to upload to the council website. Congratulations on that. Um, I don't know if, if it's a question for you, but I'm interested to know what, what will it take to get that up on the council website and when do we expect to do it? Um, the, my second question was you identified item two, the overview as something that seems reasonable to possibly check off this year. Could you explain just a little about of what that overview is, what it'll look like? I'm just having a little trouble um, picturing that in relation to the user user manual. Okay, yes, I, um, Mr. Addix, I can do this. Um, so the user manual is ready and it's online already, but it just doesn't have a link on the council website. And I think they're in the process of uh, finalizing uh, a lot of the documents that need to end up on the website. I think with the new website, some of the um, documents have been moved. So I think uh, it's imminent to get, get these items on the council website. As far as um, what's contained in the overview, the overview is um, giving a lot of information about, first of all, what is FRAM, what's the history of the, the fishery regulation assessment model program, but then it has a lot of uh, flow charts that um, show you the processes, how data is processed in FRAM, what goes in into FRAM, what, what is kind of the, the static data component versus the annual data that goes in a lot of um, the algorithms, the core algorithms are also uh, documented there. And then just uh, a bunch of lists that describe the fisheries and the stocks and the time steps. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Uh, further questions for the view? Okay. I just, Thank you. Uh, seeing uh, none, we'll move to um, SSC and uh, Galen Johnson. Galen? Good afternoon, and thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, this is Galen Johnson, the chair of the SSC, and I'll be reading our statement as soon as I my computer pulls it up properly. <laughs> um, so this is the Scientific and Statistical Committee report on salmon methodology review preliminary topic selection. The SSC met with the STT and the model evaluation work group, the MU, uh, represented by Dr. Michael O'Farrell and Ms. Angelica Hugginbro, to discuss possible methodology review topics for 2021. Items proposed for review by the STT and MU are listed below with the responsible party listed in parentheses. One, complete the Willapa Bay Coho Forecast Methodology Review. In March 2020 review, the SSC endorsed the Willapa Bay Coho Forecast for a one-time use in 2020 and identified numerous potential improvements. Uh, the responsible parties there would be the STT and WDFW. Two, review Oregon Production Index Hatchery, the OPIH forecast. Many recent forecasts have been higher than the postseason abundance estimates, and the SSC could not find a clear record of previous reviews. The responsible parties there would be the STT and the Oregon Production Index technical team or OPID. Number three, review Sacramento River Fall Chinook conservation objective and consider a natural area escapement goal as recommended in the rebuilding plan for this stock and by the Southern Resident Killer Whale Work Group and the STT. Um, and there are multiple <laughs> responsible parties there. 
Number four, update fisheries regulation assessment model documentation. Various components in FRAM were changed over time and the previous documentation is not fully reflective of the current model. Considering the workload of new members, the MU plans to prioritize updating the overview section in time for a 2021 review. The MU is also planning for a FRAM workshop in October 2021 for new members and agency staff. It was noted that the old FRAM documentation, which was previously on the council website, is not currently available. A responsible party there would be the MU. And number five, evaluate FRAM postseason performance. While there are numerous aspects of FRAM performance that should eventually be reviewed for 2021, the MU proposes to do a comparison of recent postseason FRAM runs to the Pacific Salmon Commission's Chinook Technical Committee exploitation rate analysis estimates. Evaluating this comparison will require clear documentation. And the responsible party there is the MU. The SSC recommends a high priority for the topics listed above and proposes the following additional topics to be considered. Number six, the SSC Salmon Subcommittee should go through the Salmon Fishery Management Plan and clarify the SSC's role in reviewing salmon forecasts and other models and analyses informing the management process. Uh, we put ourselves as a responsible party there. Number seven, explore methods to quantify uncertainty and forecasts and to incorporate the uncertainty into the management process. Number eight, in March 2021, preseason report one has revealed that there was a recent change in the marine survival component of the Queets Coho forecast that has not been reviewed reviewed by the SSC. In March 2021, the SSC recommended a table tracking changes and forecasting methods over time be included in preseason report one. And uh, online, we have a hyperlink to that report. The SSC is unclear on its role in reviewing every change to forecast for stocks that do not have acceptable biological catches. So addressing item number six would provide clarity on the priority for this item. And nine, due to COVID-19, there were gaps in the marking and or tagging of juvenile fish with coated wire tags in 2020, which may affect implementation of harvest models in future years as these cohorts recruit to the fishery. And that completes our statements. Okay, thank you, Galen. Um, questions for the SSE? Okay, um, seeing that, thank you, Galen. Um, next up will be uh, Joe Oatman and the uh, Tribal Report. Joe? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Mr. Chair, I think uh, uh, Susan Bishop had a question for Galen. Excuse me, Joe. Uh, Susan, you had your hand up. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I was just interested if the SSC could clarify a little bit more what they had in mind with regard to their priority number three. Um, so I, I was unclear whether that was a review of the existing methodology, uh, which is is sort of it, what we typically think of as methodology review, or if this was a, a bigger change, um, expectation for a bigger change to that conservation objective, which which could be broader in scope than what we would typically assign to the uh, SSC. Okay. Uh, thanks, Susan. Uh, Galen, are you still there? I am, and I'm rapidly, as a um, more Northern-focused person, I am rapidly reviewing notes. <laughs> um, let me pull it up. Okay. So, um, basically, it has come up in a variety of reports, um, and we noted in our one of our March statements that um, there's kind of a mismatch between the FMP and what some of the goals are. Um, so, building on comments that management bodies like the or advisory bodies like the STT and the Southern Resident Killer Whale Ad Hoc Work Group, um, as well as the rebuilding plan itself has stated. Um, it seems like something that that Simon group could review, um, but also obviously, and we're willing, and I guess we're also just saying that we're willing to review it and we see it's important. So we feel like it's a high priority um, due to the interest, but obviously we respond to what the council asks us to do and not, we don't make our own work. <laughs> All right, thank you, Galen. Um, okay, 
No more questions for SSC. Um, and Joe, we'll go back to you uh, now for the travel report. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and I certainly no, no worries about that. Uh, so we have one uh, supplemental travel report under uh, agenda item D2A. Uh, this is the joint testimony from the Western Washington Treaty Tribes. The Western Washington Treaty Tribe are concerned with the recent forecast performance for the Oregon Production Index Area Hatchery, or OPIH which is largely composed of Columbia River early and late coho hatchery stocks. Since 2015, there has been an over forecast in five of the last six years. This is noted in figure one. In two of those years, uh, those being 2015 and 2019, the preseason estimate was more than three times higher than the postseason return. Uh, this is a difference of more than 500,000 coho in each year. For example, in 2015, the preseason abundance prediction was 8,400 coho compared to the postseason estimate of 251,700 coho. In 2019, the preseason abundance prediction was 933,000 coho compared to the postseason estimate of 300,500 coho. The scale of these overestimates affects North of Falcon preseason modeling efforts. Salmon run forecasts are used during preseason planning to determine ocean quotas, uh, Pacific Salmon Treaty Management Unit status categories, and corresponding exploitation rate ranges. When a large stock aggregate such as the OPIH returns at lower than forecast abundances. It affects the exploitation rates of co-migrating stocks. In Washington, the tribes are most concerned with pre-terminal, those being ocean, impacts on Crete, Snohomish, and Strait of Juan de Fuca natural coho stocks. In 2018, the National Marine Fisheries Service declared these stocks overfished and they are currently under rebuilding plans. This management response was triggered as a result of low statement in 2015. Internationally, the U.S. has an obligation to meet the provisions of the Southern Coho Management Plan adopted by the Pacific Salmon Commission. In 2019, Southern U.S. fisheries exceeded the allowable exploitation rate, or ER, associated with multiple uh, postseason abundance categories, including the U.S. Interior Fraser cap. Uh, the cap uh, for interior Fraser was 10% uh, and the exploitation rate was 13.3%. The Pacific Salmon Treaty postseason co analysis referenced lower than forecasted abundances for the Columbia River early and late hatchery stocks as a likely factor in, in the overage, in addition to environmental variables. The 2021 OPIH forecast is. Uh, a little 1.6 million fish, uh, a return this high hasn't been seen in over 20 years. Alternatively, the 2021 forecast for Washington Coast natural coho stocks, those being the Coyote, Ho, and Queets rivers, are the lowest preseason estimate since 2016. If the Columbia River early and late hatchery coho returns do not meet expectations, then plant ocean fisheries would have a higher impact on natural stocks. This could exacerbate the natural coho issues mentioned in this statement and result in unforeseen consequences. We urge a precautionary management approach when developing 2021 fisheries. Under this agenda item, we recommend the council discussion uh, regarding the potential for an OPIH methodology review by the Science and Statistical Committee, or SSC, over the next year. As described in detail above, the scale of the OPIH over forecast in recent years is concerning, and the relative impact it has on ocean fishing opportunity, stocks of concern, and the pre-season modeling process. We believe a methodology review is appropriate based on the language in Council Operating Procedure 15, which states the SS 
C is responsible for revealing uh, forecasting methods for major PFMC stocks and states the review of current and proposed methodologies for abundance and harvest projection is intended to provide peer review of the technical estimation and modeling procedures to ensure the best and most objective technical analyses possible to minimize confusion during the preseason option development process and to resolve disputes over methodology. Uh, next, uh, there is the figure one, and that uh, provides uh, um, a graphic on the uh, preliminary preseason and postseason co stock abundance estimates for Oregon production in the cherry hatchery. For the years uh, 2008 uh, through 2020, as well as including uh, in the uh, uh, blue line, the uh, projections, preceding projection for 2021. And lastly, there is the uh, applicable references that were used for this document. So with that, Mr. Vice Chair, that concludes uh, this uh, supplemental tribal report. Thank you, Joe. Um, questions on the tribal report? Okay, seeing that, thanks Joe. And that concludes uh, our reports. Um, I see there's no public comments, which would take us to, uh, to council action, which is uh, guidance on potential methodologies to review in 2021. So, discussion? Looking for hands, always. Kyle Lennox, Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I suspect we'll bounce around among topics on this one. Um, so I'll start out with the, the Willapa Bay Coho forecast. Um, trying to think back to March of 2020, which was the last time we were all in the same room together, um, the council adopted the methodology that had been brought forth by WDFW for that forecast. Um, there were some issues raised in the review, and I think the intent had been to put it into the methodology review hopper in April of last year. Then, of course, with the pandemic hitting, we didn't um, go through the methodology review process last year. So I think it's appropriate um, for WDFW to try to bring something back this year. I will um, raise my concern that we've had some staff changes and um, some workload issues that are gonna make it tough for us to get to a, a, a good product in time for the review this year, but our intent is to do that and bring something forward. Um, we can touch base again in September when we look at formal assignments, but we're committed to, to bringing something forward as quickly as we can on that forecast. Very good, thank you, Kyle. Um, Susan Bishop, Susan. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'll defer if others have comments, um, but I am prepared to provide some observations. Okay. Looking for further hands, but uh, not seeing any, so uh, your hand is up. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I guess I would make a few observations of the of the list of important projects that have been provided by the MU and the SSC and the STT. Um, they are substantial projects, um, and as always, probably more projects and more work than the number of folks available to do them. So my comments are made in the in the spirit of of managing workload. Um, this is not to speak to the the fact that I think any of the projects it doesn't merit additional um, uh, discussion. Um, so I guess I would start with. Uh, the Sacramento objective. Um, it has been raised in several different um, forums. It is an important issue. Um, my concern is that, it, that um, the work around that objective and potential revision of that objective 
um, may require an FMP amendment, depending on where that goes, and is a substantial amount of work and uh, a considerations beyond technical considerations. So I, I'm not suggesting it doesn't deserve, it, I, I'm supporting that it deserves a look, but that the methodology review may not be the appropriate place for that significant um, a topic and a potential scope of uh, issues involved. Um, I would also note just the recommendations of six, seven, and eight on the uh, SSC's uh, suggested list. These aren't their high priority topics, but they are uh, additional considerations. There is an ongoing discussion with regard to the um, best scientific information available framework. Uh, NIMS is scheduled to discuss that with the SSC those to some topics um, present the framework in at the June meeting. Um, some of that discussion will have to do with scope and touch on some of the issues raised in the, uh, the SSC's statements. Um, my concern is that by moving those forward at this time, that would get ahead of the discussions uh, on the best scientific information available framework. Um, so I would be um, not supportive of doing that at this time. Um, I would also uh, just note that the STT, the MU, and the SSC have several overlapping topics, particularly those with regard to FRAM documentation and performance review that are really at the core of the salmon management framework and process that the council does um, and are significant workloads um, of in and of themselves. Um, and so would, from my perspective, those would be higher priorities and um, uh, would just encourage uh, uh, narrowing of the topic so to provide a manageable workload with a, a priority focus. And that concludes my comments. Uh, okay. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Brett Cormos. Brett? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, my comments are specific to the Sacramento River Fall Chinook escapement objective uh, item or items if you're looking at multiple lists. Um, I agree uh, wholeheartedly with the comments that Miss Bishop made about this particular item. Uh, I uh, certainly recognize the need uh, for this work and, and what is essentially a, a pretty antiquated objective uh, with, with uh, some limited and, and difficult to follow uh, documentation or justification. Uh, however, as Ms. Bishop stated, a few things. One, it's a significant amount of work that uh, will need to be shouldered by a multitude of uh, entities and or agencies. Um, it, does, it is something that I expect will go uh, beyond the realm of technical analysis. Um, and for one in particular, the Department of Fish and Wildlife in California uh, certainly won't have the bandwidth to shoulder this work or contribute to this work um, in the coming months, given all of the other demands, including the current uh, ad hoc work group for Sonk Coho. Um, and so, uh, while I don't uh, uh, fault the advisory bodies for including this on the list, uh, one of the, th the issues is there seems to be a lack of uh, a mechanism or, or staff, appropriate staff and time to carry that uh, item forward such that it would be re uh, ready for methodology review uh, in the fall. Um, I, and in fact, I would cons uh, I think I would encourage the council to consider whether or not that particular item uh, is better suited for some sort of a, a an ad hoc work group, um, given the the fact that there are both technical and policy uh, aspects to that, and uh, beyond that, like I said, and and Miss Bishop said. There are there's a need for a, a broad uh, group um, with a number of representatives that will need coordination and would likely benefit from support from the council. Um, and I'm not seeing the council uh, has the appetite 
or perhaps more appropriately, the bandwidth to do that work uh, and move that forward uh, between now and the fall of this year either. So uh, I'll stop there and maybe even stop short of suggesting we remove it from the list because it does have uh, a great deal of importance um, and getting it on uh, our radar is uh, good. It, that has value in and of itself. But I, I have serious doubts that we can move that forward in any uh, sort of meaningful way such that it can make the final list and actually uh, be reviewed, have, it, have work ready for review in the fall. So thank you. Thank you, Brett. Um, Joe Oman, Joe? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And I want to take this opportunity to provide um, some additional comments um, regarding the, uh, the recommendation that was set forth in the uh, supplemental trial report uh, that I just provided a, a moment ago. Uh, so uh, I, I am aware um, that the Plum River uh, Trudy tribes um, are uh, interested in, in that topic as well. And I think I understood um, that they too would be uh, supporting um, the recommendation uh, that was contained in the uh, uh, travel report. Um, so I wanted to, to make that comment. Um, we also want to uh, provide comment on some of the observations that, that I took away from the uh, reports that were provided by the uh, Bono Evaluation Work Group, uh, as well as the SSC on uh, organ production in the area hatchery. Um, noted um, that the uh, Bono Evaluation Work Group um, in that report, state that the forecast uh, has not performed well in recent years, and this year's forecast is very high. SSC in their report uh, noted that um, they seem to uh, support a, a review of the uh, forecast, um, and that they could not find a, a clear record of previous reviews. Um, but I do want to note uh, note those uh, aspects. Um, but particularly, um, I would like to see if uh, we could get some clarification on the uh, Council Operating Procedure 15, uh, which was uh, noted in the uh, Travel uh, Supplemental Report. Uh, in that um, Operating Procedure, uh, it specifically states that a review of current methodologies is allowed for major stocks. And given uh, the uh, OPIH is a, a major stock, um, that this seems to be a legitimate uh, matter um, to take up in, in a review. And so I'd like to get some clarification on that latter part if I could. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Further discussion? Uh, Chris Kern. Chris? Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm trying to kind of think there's a lot of things on the list, obviously, as, as others have pointed out, all important. Um, and so, but obviously, clearly also not probably all achievable in one go. Um, so if I, if I look at the, the sort of range of things, um, I see, uh, and Mr. Addix commented on the Willop, uh, um, the FRAM documentation comes out pretty clearly uh, as an ongoing task and one that is important. Um, I'm personally, uh, personally kind of interested in, in the comparison of postseason methods from FRAM, um, but probably not well suited to put that in a, in a form of priority uh, in the grand scheme, but it does uh, it does interest me, as does the potential for a workshop. Um, relative to Sacramento Falls Chinook, I, I agree with with what I've heard so far, which is, is I think we've all agreed it's important, also that it's going to be a big lift. Um, and so in that vein, I think I'll ask a question. Um, I know we 
look at the methodology reviews as uh, an annual, I'll call it an annual process. Um, what I mean is a process to be completed within a calendar year, basically, or, or 12 months or less. Um, but I do recall, it, I think we in the past have sometimes had things that stayed on the list because they weren't done. And so I guess a question is, um, if we, uh, is it less appropriate for us to put something on the methodology review with the full recognition and expectation that it's going to take more than one cycle, uh, as opposed to that just happening to, uh, happening to occur for some other reason, as opposed to some other mechanism, uh, such as a work group or something else. So maybe that's a question for Mr. Tracy or someone else about sort of our operating process on this. Um, Chuck? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks, Chris, for the question. Um, yeah, certainly things have appeared on the, uh, you know, sort of a uh, recurring nature of, uh, of projects. The FRAM documentation is one, certainly, uh, that, that has uh, lived there. Um, I think, uh, but I think you you make a good point, and I've heard, heard this from uh, uh, Ms. Bishop and Mr. Cormos as well. Uh, you know, the, the scope of the San, uh, Sacramento Falls Chinook Conservation Objective is uh, probably uh, larger than what we would contemplate under um, a typical methodology review process. Um, so I, I think I would encourage the council to decide, uh, you know, at some point, you know, how, how they want to pursue that. But but I guess my advice would be that it it is, you know, it is a very significant uh, component of our salmon uh, harvest, uh, sorry, salmon management. And um, and as pointed out, it's it's not just merely uh, making a technical adjustment, uh, which is permitted under uh, you know under the FMP uh, to make conservation objective adjustments through the methodology review. Um, but I think something something as uh, significant as and as uh, Mr. Cormos pointed out, as policy uh, centric as is that uh, would probably be deserving of another process. Um, so. Um, so I, I guess that that would be my advice. That uh, I mean, you can put it on here to remind yourself to to do it, but but somehow I don't think we're going to be forgetting about it. So, but I would just uh, you know maybe just encourage the council you know to think strategically about uh, when they uh, have an op opportunity in terms of uh, bandwidth and um, uh, to uh, you know pursue something like that uh, that they uh, that they move ahead with you know with a. I mean, it's not, it's not something they're going to be able to do in a, you know, in a season, uh, in an off season, it's going to, it's going to take a while. So, um, I guess that, that's my advice on that. Um, maybe I'll, I'll pause, pause there and see if, uh, see if Mr. Kern has a follow-up. Uh, actually, I was going to make a comment that was unrelated. Okay. Uh, well, at some point, I'd like to circle back around to Mr. Oatman's question, but uh, Chris, I think you have the floor, so why don't you go ahead? Uh, actually, I may be uh, um, semi-related to that question, so maybe it would be more efficient if you just went ahead and did that. I'll lower my hand. Chuck? Uh, thank you. Uh, so, Joe, uh, yeah, um, your question, um, you know, would o uh, OPI forecast be an appropriate uh, methodology review topic? Uh, I think the answer is yes, that it, that it would be. Um, yeah, I think the COP um, would uh, would allow for that, uh, and I think that was, you know, probably contemplated. And and uh, when the COP was written, that things like that would occur. Um, so um, yeah, so again, I, it's a question of uh, you know a combination of uh, priorities and uh, uh, workload capacity uh, to do that. Um, and how much uh, how much work that would involve, uh, I think there's probably needs to be some discussions between the uh, STT and um, uh, co-managers and the SSC about how complete the uh, uh, documentation for the methods are, or, or when they might have been might have occurred. Uh, the STT, I think, indicated that the that the methods are laid out in preseason one uh, that had been reviewed in the past. The SSC was uh, 
couldn't, uh, uh, at least in their initial look, uh, wasn't able to find any uh, recent records of review or any, any maybe sufficient uh, documentation that that's satisfied them. So uh, I think there needs, probably needs to be just some discussion there to see what um, see what people are looking for. Maybe I'll pause there. Thanks, Chuck. Um, uh, Brett Corbos, Brett. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I think I'll circle back to the Sacramento River Falls Chinook statement objective item again. Um, in listening to Mr. Tracy, uh, I think that I agree uh, with him that that this particular topic is perhaps not appropriate for methodology review, at least not until uh, a method has been developed um, or, uh, excuse me, even a, a, a new escapement objective has been de de developed by some other process. Uh, and, and so I think it might be appropriate to remove it from the methodology review list for the time being, um, at, at least until a point uh, at which we we do understand that it needs to be uh, on this list and reviewed by uh, the SSC, um, I, and I'll just note in 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 suggesting that that uh, this item is also already uh, in the council's future future workload planning, uh, and as such has a placeholder of of sorts. Um, so I don't know that it needs to stay on li this list for that purpose. Uh, so I'll stop there and see if there's any further discussion on that. Thanks, Brett. Um, further discussion? Okay. Well, given that, um, no more hands. Um, it's been a good discussion. Um, I'm just kind of curious about as far as uh, um, what the other process might be for the uh, Sacramento and how we might uh, and when that would, um, if there would be an, um, an ad hoc work group maybe that was discussed earlier that would, that would, that would be formed. Um, And with that, maybe I may should just turn to um, Robin and say, Robin, how are we doing this as far as what's our next steps? I'll put you on the spot. No problem, Mr. Vice Chair. I think um, what we would like to get out of the council uh, before we close up this agenda item is to um, get a, a list of, of topics, you know, perhaps combined from the uh, four reports that we heard, um, just uh, one list that then the uh, pertinent advisory bodies could work off of um, between now, April and um, September when we pick this up again. I think that would be the best um, way to proceed is just to ask for motions for uh, topics that are going to move forward. Okay, that, that sort of makes sense. Um, of course, I can't make a motion. You, you wouldn't want mine anyway. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so we've had some good, good input, obviously. And I see Chuck has his hand up. Chuck? Uh, thanks, Mr. Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, well, I can't make a motion either, but... Uh, <laughs> But I'm not sure that we that we absolutely need a motion here. Um, I, I, it, the uh, action is just guidance. Um, so uh, I've been keeping some notes. So uh, maybe I, if I just kind of go through what I've got and um, see if people uh, want to add uh, or subtract anything from that list of potential topics for review in 2021, that might be a place to start. 
So um, what, what I heard uh, was that uh, the Willapa Coho follow-up for uh, for WDFW was a was a priority uh, for NIMS, the FRAM documentation and uh, was was a priority. Um, also for uh, for Oregon, I heard I also heard both of those Willapa Coho and FRAM documentation um, uh, from. Um, Joe Oatman, I heard the OPI forecast is uh, would be a priority for them, and then uh, maybe uh, uh, some interest, but maybe not a high priority for Oregon was the FRAM workshop or the uh, pre-post uh, um, comparison. Um, so that that's kind of what I had, and then I guess for what was you know less of a um, priority was the. Uh, Sacramento Falls Chinook uh, escapement objective and, and forecast, and, uh, and then the SSC uh, lower priority six through nine items. So, uh, so anyway, so so if I was if I was making a list from what I heard, it would be Willapa Coho, uh, Fram documentation, um, and uh, I forecast. So I guess I would start there and see if there's anything that people want to add or subtract from that list. Well, I think that uh, you've uh, got some interest from Chris Kerr. So, Chris? Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, and thanks, uh, Mr. Tracy, for that. That's helpful. Um, I didn't speak to OPI earlier, uh, so I'll take a minute to, if it's okay to do that. Um, not going to ask that we take it off the list uh, for consideration. I'm interested in what other folks have to say. Uh, clearly understand the concerns raised and, and being a, a large contributor in some years in particular, um, understand what that means. Um, and, and so while I can look in the preseason reports and find other forecast models that have also had performance issues in recent years, I do understand that the fact that this is a larger stock uh, raises attention for folks. And, and I appreciate that. And of course, I I will not be one to come in and say I don't care about how well a forecast is performing. I absolutely do. So uh, we all, I think, have a shared goal of trying to make sure that those are doing the best we can. I will say I have the concerns I do have uh, are are similar to what I heard a bit of before, and that is um, workload. We we in Oregon, at least, and I won't speak for others, have faced a similar. Uh, situation to what I heard earlier in, in loss of some key staff uh, and key staff being assigned to other tasks. And so, so I, we're going to struggle a bit uh, if this goes forward to, to pull uh, what I would want uh, to be able to contribute from Oregon to the process may be a bit of a struggle for us. But um, if that's what the council, uh, rest of the council members are supportive of doing, we will strive to, to find ways to do that. So uh, I don't want to belabor that um, too much. I just uh, get that out, out there um, so folks are aware. Um, that, that's kind of why I haven't commented so far to date, not, not to try and downgrade the importance of, of our, any of our forecasts, whether it be this one or, or another. But uh, I do have some concerns with that. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Susan Bishop, Susan. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I would just also note uh, at least my support for the evaluation of postseason metrics. So the sort of the FRAM model performance. I note that was on both the SSC's list and the um, salmon technical team. I can't recall if it was on the MUSE list or not. Uh, I think that would be important as well. Um, I would also just speaking to some of Mr. Kern's concerns and my own previous statements about workload, um, I think there is a fairly robust process in place with review of the OPI forecast to so the to the degree to which the council process can coordinate with with those folks um, and review what has been done um, and uh, be efficient in the use of workload and staff resources. Um, we would encourage that. Okay, thanks, Susan. Uh, Phil Anderson, Phil. 
Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair, and um, appreciate the conversation here. Um, I guess I would add my voice of, of um, support uh, relative to the OPI um, forecast issue, uh, exactly what needs to be done, particularly based on the bishop's comments here just a moment ago, um, of which I, I, I'm not aware of uh, relative to the um, work that has been done or is normally done in terms of reviewing uh, that forecast and the methodology. But um, as Mr. Kern uh, said, uh, the size of this stock and the consequences of um, to other stocks when we uh, miss the forecast by a significant amount, particularly when we're when we're uh, estimating uh, uh, significantly higher than the actual return, just really, uh, as everybody knows, um, uh, has a, a significant effect on on a number of the other stocks in terms of what in terms of managing them and ensuring that we're meeting uh, their conservation objectives. And we've also got our obligations under the Pacific Salmon Treaty um, uh, and um, uh, the, the stock and, and the relative accuracy of its forecast uh, uh, plays a big role in whether or not uh, we have confidence um, that we're meeting our obligations under the treaty. So, um, again, I, um, I I wouldn't know exactly where to start on this. Uh, maybe there's there's some um, work that can be done initially in terms of understanding what is being done already, in terms of reviewing the methodology uh, that's used. Uh, but it is among the items it has a high priority from my perspective. Thanks, Bill. Okay, uh, Susan Bishop, Susan. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I'm sort of stealing some of Angelica's thunder um, in uh, re responding to uh, Mr. Anderson's questions. And my and workload concerns that have been raised. I mean, one suggestion on the OPIT forecast might be to initiate a work group or sorry, a workshop um, with whoever is assigned to do this work to understand what has been done, what's been reviewed, uh, recommendations that may have already been made. Um, if there were, if there was a previous review, uh, to to sort of nail the starting point uh, that would be most efficient going forward. Uh, Chris Kerr. Th thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, yeah, I'm thinking about this a little bit in the context of, of what I, the last, um, Mr. Anderson and Ms. Bishop. Um, once the, I'll just say the dust uh, settles from spring planning and, and our technical folks are able to come up for a bit of air for a bit, we, we may be able to convene the OPIC group and and you know other folks who might be interested as well. And we've we've had um, we've had uh, some additions to folks sitting in more frequently in in that group, as far as I understand, uh, over the last couple of years. So uh, I'm thinking about those folks as well, uh, and not not to exclude anybody else necessarily. Uh, to go through uh, kind of what Miss Bishop just laid out, kind of kind of overview what what's been done. Um, and I'd have to leave it to them to decide, you know, what additional in that regard needs to be brought out that isn't, you know, just part of the normal process. I, my, my recollection is there's some review of performance every year, uh, regardless, but it might be a little deeper dive. Uh, and then use that to help vet sort of how we might assign things out in a way that we can actually get the work done uh, to meet some of the workload concerns that, that I've expressed at least. Um, that might be something that could be productive if if uh, it's the council's wish wishes to uh, to move forward with that as an item. 
Thanks, Chris. For the thoughts. Okay, I see. Uh, oh, Chuck. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I guess if, if the discussion about uh, what are what are ripe candidates for 2021 is uh, winding down, I, I did maybe just want to circle back and on the Sacramento Fall Chinook and uh, Mr. Cormos is correct. We do have placeholders uh, to look at uh, both Klamath and Sacramento conservation objectives and uh, Sacramento age structured assessment uh, in September. And uh, since uh, this is a, a meeting where uh, all the salmon folks are here and uh, that may not be the case uh, in June, when we go to set the September agenda, I would encourage you to think about uh, how you want to handle those uh, those current placeholders and uh, whether it's, you know, just move them to the end of the year at a glance or uh, find a spot for them uh, sometime uh, in the next uh, five meeting process. Uh, I would encourage you to uh, to do that and be prepared to uh, address that under workload planning so that we can uh, we can do something smart with them and uh, make our planning for September um, a little easier uh, when it comes to our meeting in June. Thank you. Good day, Chuck. All right. Uh, Brett Gormos, Brett. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thank you, Mr. Tracy. Uh, certainly understand that workload planning is the appropriate place to address that issue. However, since I have the opportunity, I think I will at least just uh, communicate to the council that I would not expect those topics to be ripe for the council to address until at least sometime in 2022. Um, and given the fact that I have already and will again encourage the council to consider some sort of a work group process for addressing at least the Sacramento River Fall Chinook ob objective. Um, uh, I would I would allow as much time for that process uh, to happen as possible in selecting a place to put those on uh, in terms of a meeting um, for the future council uh, workload. Um, and regarding the Klamath Falls Chinook objective, uh, it may be more appropriate to um, think about that objective in terms of when the dams come out uh, and we've gathered enough data post dam to begin to look at those. So uh, that, that particular item uh, may not be ripe next year at all. So I'll, I'll stop there and, and we can address those uh, issues at, at a later point in the meeting. Thanks, Brett, those are good, uh, those are good points. Um, I thought I saw a hand there, but uh, not no more. Okay, so I think, I guess we have a pretty good handle on this um, as far as, um, well, uh, what's on the list? Um, let's see no more hands. Um, I would look to Robin and say, Robin, do you have enough here to uh, make this work? Yes, thanks to the help of Mr. Tracy and additional uh, council members. I think we have enough information to where we can um, develop a list and, and move forward and uh, come back to you in September and let you know what we've done. Okay, wonderful. Uh, thank you, Robin. Um, with that, I believe that concludes this action, I believe. And I will hand this gavel um, back to our chairman, Mark. Thanks. Thank you, Brad. Uh, good job there. Um, I think that concludes all the items we're going to move up for the day. Um, and so tomorrow we will be back on schedule with coastal pelagic species. Uh, starting at eight o'clock, but uh, before we break, I'll turn to Chuck Tracy to see if he has uh, any anything to add. 
Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, good job today. Um, got through things, got a couple things uh, moved up, so that feels good. Um, we will start on coastal pelagic species tomorrow uh, and go through our normal agenda. Uh, I did uh, maybe just want to uh, remind council members uh, something I usually do early in, earlier in the meeting, I forgot to, but uh, just as a reminder, um, when you are able to uh, send your motions in advance to, uh, to Sandra, um, if you could uh, please remember to, uh, to copy the uh, staff officer in the seat as well. Uh, that would be helpful. It helps for uh, for them at the very least to get a get a look at the motion, so they can uh, be prepared to uh, um, provide any advice uh, on the motion, so that uh, it takes less time on the on the floor. So uh, just appreciate if you would uh, if you would uh, remember to do that. So thank you very much. All right. Thanks for that, Chuck. Uh, thanks everyone for the good work today. We got this April meeting off to a really good start. Let's keep it going. I guess our challenges will probably come next week, but let's let's keep it going here. So we'll see everyone tomorrow at 8 a.m. for coastal pelagic species. Thanks, Coach.